Madam President. <clears throat> the Senator from Utah. Madam President, I rise today because... Uh, Senator, the Senator is in a quorum yes. call. Madam President, I ask unanimous consent that the quorum call be suspended. Without objection. Madam President, I rise today because Senate Republicans made a commitment last fall, not so very long ago, a commitment uh, that we made to each other and that we made to the American people. That commitment was simple. It was one that said, before we send another dollar, another dime, another penny to Ukraine, let's do what we can, even if it means harnessing the drive that some in this body feel towards sending more money to Ukraine. And let's harness that to make sure that we can force the will within the administration to actually enforce the border. In truth, we've all made commitments sort of like this. We've all made other commitments that should lead us to this conclusion, should have gotten us there long ago, with or without Ukraine funding on the line, with or without anything compelling us to do it, because every single senator, every man, every woman serving in this body is committed to this sacred duty. It did so implicitly when we raised our hands as required under Article VI of the Constitution to take an oath to, quote, support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and bear true faith and allegiance to the same. Well, through our, through time and through the efforts of a faithless few, we're now poised to treat that commitment that we made to each other as Senate Republicans and to Americans sort of the same way that President Biden has treated his own solemn oath to protect this country's borders, treating them as somehow ex expedient, expendable, and now apparently expired. Mr. President, Madam President, we, we cannot send billions of dollars to Ukraine while America's own borders are bleeding. This betrayal is all the more loathsome because it occurs at a time when the eyes of the nation are turned to sport and family and fun, as well they should be. Heaven help us. The people of America should not have to watch us every hour of every day, lest their own government stab them in the back. What, after all, have they done to deserve such untrustworthy public servants? What grudge does this body hold against the very people who elected us and pay our salaries? Today, we witness the tragic dominance of what President Eisenhower, one of our nation's great patriots and great generals, who later became president, what he called the military-industrial complex. This machine, to be clear, was not built by our brave men and women in uniform who pledged their very lives every day for safety and independence. Nor was it built by every contractor, every person or entity out there that supplies our men and women in uniform with weapons and cutting-edge technology that they need to protect the United States against our adversaries. Now, many of them are, are not at all part of the military-industrial complex, regardless of what they may do for a living. But I do speak of a subset of those individuals and entities. When I speak of a machine forged by the unhealthy union between their businesses, and politicians in Washington, D.C., specifically to make a business out of bloodshed and do so in concert with 
politicians in Washington and across the world who make bloodshed their business. All of this at the expense of our freedom, our honor, and our self-determination, to say nothing of the time that Americans have to spend paying to fund the military-industrial complex. Now, make no mistake, I'm, I'm under no illusion that my time here today will, will itself somehow be sufficient to jam the gears of this machine. Nor is it likely to stifle the anthems of those who worship it. But I intend to give an account of how, in this instance, sadly, like so many others, its acolytes have consumed resources meant for the security and welfare of our own people to continue violence among people far away with whom we're not at war and from whose suffering we, the American people, will gain no victory. And perhaps if I can sketch a blueprint of how this infernal engine functions today, future generations may well succeed in loosening its screws cutting off its stolen fuel, and letting the whole corrupt bargain come crashing, finally, to the ground. As I do so, I need to go back for a moment and describe the conditions last fall in which Republicans made the commitment I described a moment ago, the commitment to each other and to the American people what we saw last fall was that there was yet another call from President Biden and from many in the Pentagon and in the military industrial complex for yet another round of Ukraine funding. This after we've already sent uh, some $113 billion to Ukraine, a sum of money that last time I checked is roughly double what Russia spends on national defense in an average year it is, and is uh, perhaps 20, 25 times what Ukraine spends on defense in a typical year. It's a sum of money that exceeds what any other nation has spent on Ukraine, either in nominal sums as a percentage of GDP by pretty much any metric. And when we talk about the defense-specific aid, to my knowledge, it's significantly higher than every other nation's security assistance to Ukraine combined since the start of this war. It's a large sum of money. Now, this request came at a time when the American people were starting to realize increasingly the extent to which excessive spending in Washington, D.C. has affected their day-to-day -day lives. They started to sense what we've long been warning of, what was predictable, foreseeable, and in fact foreseen and specifically warned of since the outset of this administration. That when we spend too much money, everything gets more expensive. And by everything, I mean literally everything, including an especially basic living expenses. If you take a look, Madam President, at what it costs to sustain a family, to sustain a household, for the average American household, since the day President Biden took office, just over three years ago, it costs about $1,000 a month per household more than it did on January 20th, 2021. This is no small sum. Adds up to about $12,000 a year just for the average household in America. Now, this, of course, affects different people differently. But for America's middle class, and certainly for its poor, this can mean the difference between living paycheck to paycheck and making it and living paycheck to paycheck and then not making it. This is felt by families uh, throughout the middle class, throughout America, in ways that leave no room for anything. This comes right off of their 
bottom line is for many means nothing other than what's the bare minimum to live can be justified, can be afforded. Family vacations for countless Americans, thing of the past now. If they were just getting by before Bidenomics wreaked havoc on their paycheck and on what little savings they may have had, that cushion's no longer there if it was even there to begin with. This is, to be sure, not just something that occurs out of nowhere. This occurs because Washington spent too much money. Milton Friedman uh, warned of this many decades ago, when, among other things, he explained that the true cost of government is reflected less accurately in the rate of taxation and more accurately in the rate of government spending relative to the economy. Because, as he explained, the way our system works and the way the Federal Reserve Bank and the Treasury interact with our system in which the U.S. dollar is the world's reserve currency, all these things combine in such a way that when the U.S. government borrows more money, when it engages in more deficit spending, it has a very similar effect as what we would see if we just printed more money, which effectively we are doing. I've warned of this for many years. Over periods of time that have spanned three different presidential administrations under two different political parties, both as they've been in charge of the White House and been in charge of the Senate, the House of Representatives. I've warned of these consequences under Senate's Houses of Representatives and White Houses of every conceivable partisan combination. In each time warning, something like this, that as we continue to do this, it'll make each dollar spend less money and we'll get closer and closer to that day when our interest in our national debt will start to eclipse other priorities. When I started warning of this, I think our annual interest payment on national debt was somewhere in the range of $250, $300 billion a year. It's now more than double that. Some have expected that uh, by the end of this fiscal year, we'll see interest on the national debt accruing at a rate of uh, a trillion or more a year. Just the difference between where we were just a few years ago and where we could well be within the next six, eight months, maybe the next year or two, could well exceed what we spend on national defense. This isn't sustainable. And in any event, as Milton Friedman explained, the true rate of taxation is explained best by total government spending as a percentage of GDP even more than it is by the rate of taxation. His explanation for this uh, makes a lot of sense uh, once you fully consider what he's saying. But part of the rate of taxation, as you have to imagine it, it ends up being the inflationary impact of the government just printing more money when it refuses defiantly, as it has been in, over the last few years, to acknowledge that there's any limit on its ability to spend more. Now, in the last three or four years, we, we seem to have taken that to a true extreme. With multi-trillion dollar deficits every single year. For the last three or four years prior to that, we had been on a pattern of roughly a, a trillion dollar a year deficits. And each moment when we turned down that ugly corridor. I've noted that this was happening and is happening today, kind of at the, the, at the peak of the economic cycle, with really low unemployment. It's not one of these circumstances where we are forced into this simply because, contrary to all expectations, 
there isn't enough money for government to run uh, to perform its basic functions, things that only government can perform. No, this is just because this body can't control itself. It can't control its ability to spend to the tune of trillions of dollars a year more than we have. And it's gotten so much worse during this administration. It was bad enough before then, but it's gotten so much worse since then. With trillions upon trillions of dollars a year being spent in excess of what we bring in. So it shouldn't come as any shock that the American dollar today buys a whole lot less than it did just a few short years ago. And that the average American family has to shell out an additional $1,000 a month just to live. Just to live. From gas to groceries, from housing to health care, and everything else. Everything costs more today because the government has flooded the market with new cash. So what does that do to ordinary people? Most Americans live on a relatively fixed set of money. They're living on a salary, perhaps on a pension. Perhaps they're living off of wages or payments if they're independent contractors that don't vary a lot from one year to the next. And even if they're lucky enough to have gotten a raise since January 20th, 2021, nearly all of the time it's not nearly enough to cover the difference in what they're having to shell out and because of Bidenomics and because of this chronic uh, pattern of overspending that, of course, predated Bidenomics, but has become significantly worse since President Biden took office. That the American people are suffering, and they're suffering badly. Perversely, America's wealthiest don't suffer from this in the same way. N not at all, in fact. Quite the contrary, many of them get far wealthier during periods of great inflation. Wall Street, you'll notice, has been elated, has reason to rejoice recently, but those rejoicings are not felt up and down the economic ladder, no. Quite to the contrary, they're felt in ways that should not make this body or anyone that has anything to do with these dramatic and unjustifiable increases in federal spending feel ashamed. And so the American people have understandably become more and more leery of spending that isn't deemed essential, that isn't deemed something that goes directly to the benefit of the American people, any spending that's not necessarily ours to have to be responsible for. It's not to say that there aren't plenty of Americans who are understandably, justifiably concerned about Vladimir Putin. He's not a nice man. He's not uh, behaved well especially with regard to Ukraine. At the same time, remember, we've sent over $113 billion already to that country. Meanwhile, we continue to receive pressure from our European allies, our NATO partners, who increasingly love to say things like, uh, all eyes are turning to the United States. We're relying on the United States to solve this, to fix this. You've got to s spend more money. Uh, apparently feeling no sense of irony or responsibility on their part as they say this. They just want us to turn on our printing presses yet again, send more money over there yet again. Well, why? Why is this? Why, why shouldn't they have to at least first match or exceed 
in nominal dollars and as a percentage of their combined GDP what we've sent. In fact, why shouldn't they have to far exceed that? This is in their backyard, not ours. They have more at stake. They have greater familiarity with the area, the region, than we do. And it's closer to where they are than we are. And we've already spent a whole lot more than any of them and, or all of them combined. So why is this ours to do and not theirs? Why are all eyes turning to America? Well, they're turning to America because America has, in the past, especially the recent past, been far more willing to open its wallet. And as long as you've got one party at the dinner table who's perceived as the one most likely to pick up the check, sometimes, sometimes the eyes turn to that party. And clearly they are here. But let's think about this for a minute. Separate and apart from the fact that they're closer to the action, they have more at stake. They've also been the beneficiaries of a security umbrella funded disproportionately by the American people. Not just for years, but for decades. In fact, for the entirety of, of my lifetime. We have been the largest backstop by far to the security umbrella that our NATO partners and allies in Europe enjoy. There's been an understanding in recent years that everyone in NATO should spend at least 2% of their GDP on defense. And some have tried to honor it. Most of them have not been consistent in honoring it. Many, if not most, are not honoring it as we speak. And so the, here again, it's, it's understandable why their eyes would all turn to us. We provided them that security backstop for decades, disproportionately providing the funds, the resources, the human resources, the technological resources and otherwise to help ensure their security. Now, We've done this for decades in part because, you know, we've, we've seen it as a partnership. It's, we've seen this as something that can benefit the American people. But we always have to have that discussion as Americans. We can't just continue to be that backstop unflinchingly without continuing to ask the question year after year, month after month, what are we getting out of this and are they also doing their fair share? The cynic, when looking at this, could credibly argue that the American taxpayer has been not only making them more secure, more safe by providing a significant portion of their defense umbrella, but that by so doing, the American taxpayer has also funded all kinds of other things in Europe that have nothing to do with European or American national security. You see, those countries, buoyed up by our generous support consistent support of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization have freed up budgetary resources within those member states to do other things. So the Senate could argue, you know, we've, we've, we've helped them not only with their own national security needs, but also even with all kinds of social programs, whatever it is that they're spending money over, over there to do through their government. We've made it easier. And it's really hard for the American taxpayer to look at that, to see that, to see that that's been happening for decades. And their eyes are still turned to us. Their hands are still outstretched for us to do more than they have been willing to do to protect themselves in their own backyard. The American people have seen this. And they've started to get the sense that Maybe, just maybe, their hands are still outstretched because we've established this pattern, this expectation that we will do more than they will do in this war, that we will do more than they would otherwise have to do simply because we're there and they rely on us. So the American people started asking, why are we continuing to do this when they're not pulling their share, and when their share is and properly should be a lot more than ours, given their proximity to the action and given their long-time 
reluctance to fund their own security needs in their own nations. It's a reasonable question a lot of Americans are asking. This question becomes even more poignant, and the answers to those questions more important to address carefully and thoroughly when you consider that as we're trying to help secure the border integrity of Ukraine, our own border is in a state of absolute pandemonium, utter chaos and utter freefall. This is added to their concerns. So this is part of that backdrop against the commitment Republicans in the Senate made to each other and to the public just a few short months ago, last fall, as we started talking about this Ukraine aid package. Here are some of the factors that have been unfolding. Factors that have caused the American people concern. Now, just a few short weeks ago, the House Judiciary Committee released a report containing new data showing the severity of the Biden border crisis. These numbers are shocking. And they also confirm the numbers that Americans were seeing in smaller pieces, bit by bit, last fall, causing them, understandably, to feel real concern about this. It was an, there was an article, I believe in Time Magazine, just a few months ago, talking about the fact that between May or June of last year and uh, October or November of last year, support for additional aid to Ukraine had plummeted dramatically, uh, the point where it was, uh, well, while most Americans uh, at one point uh, supported it, it's a minority of Americans that did by, uh, by November, in part because they were aware of this phenomenon unfolding on our border, this phenomenon that uh, was laid out in great detail in this report issued just a few weeks ago by the House Judiciary Committee. Since January 20th, 2021, the day that Joe Biden was sworn in as the 46th President of the United States, the Biden administration has released into the United States more than 3.3 million illegal aliens. In fact, in a January 2024 interview, Secretary Mayorkas the, who runs the Department of Homeland Security, who's in charge of the Border Patrol and Immigration and Customs Enforcement, protecting the American homeland, as his departmental name implies. He admitted as much, stating that the Biden administration has released, in his words, quote, more than a million illegal aliens each year. Each year. Those are just the ones that they released. These are not encounters or, or known gotaways, which are at least another 1.7 million, probably a lot more than that. And these are people they caught and then released into your hometown, my hometown, into every hometown in America. Why? Why would they do this? We have an elaborate body of laws that is designed to protect us against this. We have an elaborate array of law enforcement entities whose job it is not to facilitate this mass invasion, but rather to oppose it, to slow it, to deter it, to halt it, to reverse it, whenever, wherever possible, in myriad ways. By the way, who exactly are these people that they're just catching and releasing? 
Here's how the House report describes it. Quote, people from all over the planet are taking advantage of the turmoil at the southern, at the southwest border. In fiscal year 2023, Border Patrol encountered illegal aliens from roughly 170 countries, including, this is interesting, 2,000, 24,048, 24,048 from China, 15,429 from Turkey, 15,000 from Mauritania, 10,368 from Uzbekistan, 7,390 from Russia, 5,604 from Afghanistan, 3,087 from Egypt, 1,270 from Pakistan, 1,122 from Kyrgyzstan, 457 from Iran, 375 from Syria, 81 from Iraq, and 74 from Yemen. That was a quote from the report. Those are actual numbers. We've got countries, countries that are not exactly friendly to the United States. Quite to the contrary. Country after country whose own people have entered our country, entered our borders, without documentation, then been released into our own country by our own government. Why? And we've got them coming in in numbers from some specific countries that are larger than the towns, the entire cities of voters in each of our states. In each of our states, we've got people who live in cities, towns, communities that are much smaller than, um, than these numbers, than the more than 24,000 from China, 15,500 from Turkey, 15,263 from Mauritania. Why do we have that money coming in from Iran? That money from Syria and Iraq and Yemen. That money coming in from Afghanistan. Those numbers should concern you. They should concern everyone. Why is this happening? But more importantly, why is our own administration, why is there our own president and his administration so determined to facilitate this and to not stop it? Those numbers are just from fiscal year 2023, by the way. They don't take into account people who have come in since then. And we know that since then, the fiscal year 2023 ended at midnight, at the end of September 30th. And we know that since September 30th of last year, we've seen record after record after record broken for daily migrant encounters. One can imagine that it's only gotten much worse since then. Now think about all of that. At the same time that we're handing over our weapons reserves to Ukraine, reserves that could take a decade or more to replace, we're just al allowing people into our country, catching and releasing military-aged males from China, from Russia, from Afghanistan, from Iran, from Syria. Why? What sane, non-suicidal nation would do this? Well, America, the nation wouldn't. The American people wouldn't. The American people are not the same as those who administer their government. They should be. They should be accountable. The one should be accountable to the other. But lately, they're not. Lately, they're doing things that I think if you randomly selected people from the phone book, 
I don't even know if phone books exist anymore. You randomly selected them from some other, say, voter rolls, and you called them and said, what do you think? Should we release 24,000 Chinese nationals who have crossed into our border without documentation, having paid each of them many, many thousands of dollars? In the case of Chinese nationals, uh, probably well into the tens of thousands of dollars per person to be smuggled into the United States, should we release them? Well, I can't imagine that many randomly selected Americans would do this, so why is our own government doing it? It's baffling. Why would it do this and at the same time say, yeah, this is nothing to worry about, and let's give a lot of our weapons stockpiles to another sovereign nation to fight yet another nation half a world away. Those two things coming at the same time seem rather dangerous. Analogous, you might say, to drinking and driving. If one drinks and remains in one's home, doesn't handle any dangerous equipment, one might be relatively safe. If one drives without drinking, it, driving can be done safely, especially if the person is not inebriated. But if you put those things together, you drink and then you drive, you could have some real problems. Here, I don't think either of these things would be safe to do. I don't think it's safe to release many tens of thousands of foreign nationals, even if you just limited it to these countries, to say nothing of the millions of total foreign nationals that have been released into the United States after crossing our borders without documentation. When you take into account the many tens of thousands of people coming from countries where we have a lot of enemies, where in many cases the regime in power of those countries is itself our sworn enemy and may well be behind efforts to get these people into the United States for purposes that are hostile to our interests. I can't imagine why we'd want to do this. Why would we want to do this at all? And then why would we want to do that at the same time when we're depleting our own weapons reserves, including reserves of some fairly sophisticated weaponry that could take us years, if not a decade or more, to replace? It's baffling. Now, in January, the U.S. Customs and Border Protection watered down the screening process for Chinese asylum seekers amidst a record surge of such cases. The Biden administration, for its part, streamlined words in quotes, streamlined the process by slashing the number of questions officials are required to ask of Chinese nationals from almost 40 until just a few weeks ago down to five. So the Biden administration is giving away our reserves of our weapons to be used for our own self-defense while simultaneously making it easier for bad actors from countries like China to embed themselves into our country, contrary to our laws. This does not sound like national security. This sounds like the exact opposite of national security. Of the nearly six million illegal alien encounters that have occurred since January 6th, uh, since January 20th, 2021, through September 30th, 2023, which is the end of fiscal year 2023. At least 3,095,577 illegal aliens had no confirmed departure from the United States as of the end of September. In fact, according to the House report, Immigration and Customs Enforcement's uh, ICE, as it's known, ICE's non-detained docket swelled to a record of nearly 6.2 million illegal aliens 
as of the end of the last fiscal year. <coughs> there are at least 617,607 aliens on ICE's non-detained docket who have criminal convictions or pending criminal charges, meaning more than half a million criminal aliens are on the streets of the United States and therefore free and somewhat likely to reoffend in U.S. communities. This is not hypothetical. It happens every day. This is not paranoid fantasy. This is the sad, tragic reality of America in 2024. Let me say that again. Over half a million people, over 500,000 criminal aliens are in our communities. As of December 10, 2023, there were 1,323,264 illegal aliens with final orders of removal who remained in the United States. The Department of Homeland Security placed only 6.8 percent of illegal aliens encountered at the southwest border into proceedings to even be screened for asylum eligibility. Remember, one of the ways in which this thing has started, one of the ways in which it, it began, it's mushroomed it's into something much bigger than that. But at the end of the Trump administration, um, we had secured our southern border. Sure, there were still a few people trickling across, but it was um, in numbers low enough that they were able to detect them, apprehend them, and deport them with sufficient regularity that the numbers were slowing month after month. And once that happens, the international drug cartels that between them make many tens of billions of dollars every single year off of this human smuggling, human trafficking, and in many instances, um, human sex slavery operations all connected to these caravans of people migrating illegally into the United States. They were able to see that this was becoming a less profitable business. Why? Well, because people won't pay many thousands of dollars in some cases. <clears throat> people from some countries, particularly high-risk individuals, might end up paying many tens of thousands of dollars. But the ones who pay the least, I believe, are paying I don't know, five, six, seven thousand dollars to be brought across. People will stop paying that when they see that their chances of getting across the border are relatively low, that their chances of being detected, apprehended, detained, and then deported are relatively high. A business is going to dry up, and this self-licking ice cream cone, this self-perpetuating machine suddenly stops having the success it once had. That's where we were as of the end of 2020. But as of December, or as of January 20th, 2021, the Biden administration made clear that these things were going to change. It made clear, among other things, that uh, the Biden administration would be abandoning, <clears throat> halting, ending the so-called Remain, <clears throat> Remain in Mexico program under the official title of the Migrant Protection Program, as well as Safe Third Countries, uh, Safe Third Country Agreements entered into with other Latin American nations. The idea behind these programs was that if you crossed into the United States on land through our southern border, obviously you'd be crossing in from Mexico. The idea was that if you crossed in, you'd be sent back to Mexico. If you applied for asylum, <clears throat> as many illegal immigrants do, as many who show up without papers, without documentation, and therefore illegally in the United States, <clears throat> Historically, many of them have filed immediate applications for asylum. Now, the numbers vary a bit, but estimates out there are that 
at least 90 percent. Some have said it's more like 98 percent. I don't know <clears throat> where the true figure is, but it's, it's clearly overwhelmingly um, that if you apply for asylum, you're probably not going to get it after crossing illegally into our country. There are certain statutory criteria <clears throat> that they have to meet. They have to establish that they are eligible for a grant of asylum. And it, and it has to do with, uh, with <clears throat> establishing a credible fear of, of persecution within, by their home country, um, uh, pertaining to uh, one of the protected classes identified in the statute. Historically, a lot of the people who come into our country without documentation, illegally in other words, have applied for asylum, but at least nine out of ten of them, sometimes the numbers, depending on whose statistics you, uh, you put the most faith in, say that it's uh, closer to ten out of ten, of those individuals will on average be denied <clears throat> asylum. They won't be able to stay here. Problems arise, though, when this administration took control. It ended the Remain in Mexico program, and that program, again, had said that if you cross into the United States by land from Mexico without documentation thereafter claim asylum, you're going to have to remain in Mexico. You'll have to be deported back to Mexico, where you'll wait, regardless of where you were from. In some cases, you might be able to be deported to your home country, but <clears throat> regardless, <clears throat> at most, you'll be sent back to Mexico, where you'll have to wait and wait and wait to see whether your asylum application has been adjudicated by an immigration judge as meritorious. Then, and only then, could you enter the United States. When the Trump administration put this, this program in place, <clears throat> these waves of illegal migrants, these caravans, which once a torrent, once a a raging river slowed down to a trickle. Why? Well, because people knew it wasn't worth spending the time and the money to say nothing of the risk to life and limb, to say nothing of the fact that by some accounts it's 30 percent, by other accounts it's 60 some odd percent of the women and girls, in some cases also men and boys who were trafficked on these caravans are sexually assaulted along the way. Countless of them are subjected to human sex trafficking, to sex slavery. During my most recent visit to the U.S.-Mexico border in the McAllen, Texas area, an area where I spent two years, two wonderful years as a missionary, 30-some-odd years ago, in the early 1990s. During my most recent visit there, just a few weeks ago, I was told something stunning by the Border Patrol personnel there who said, you know, for the first time since the 1860s, for the first time since the end of the Civil War and then the ratification of the 13th Amendment, which prohibits slavery and indentured servitude, we now have significant numbers of people for the first time since the Civil War, who are living in indentured servitude, many of those in sex slavery. It was ground to a halt once Remain in Mexico was instituted. But one of the first things President Biden did when he came into office was to get rid of it. Now, a number of court battles have erupted since then. They've been boiling, simmering, boiling over, coming back again at times. President Biden lost multiple rounds of that litigation, still dragging his feet, doing everything he can, kicking and screaming to make sure that he doesn't have to put it in place. Why? Why? Why would he want to do that? Well, for reasons that I cannot fathom, He's decided he wants kind of an open borders environment. 
It's not what our laws say. It's not what the American people want or accept. It's not what any sane nation would do. Part of what makes a country a country is that we know what the country is and what the country is not. It's defined by its outer bound limits. Sort of the, as the saying goes, if everyone's family, no one's it. No one is. If everyone's an America, an American, what, what is America after all? To say nothing of the lawlessness that you invite. When you bring in people who are not vetted, who we know nothing about, who overwhelmingly not only don't speak English, but aren't familiar with our customs, our culture, our laws. That's why many people have said that this is tantamount to an invasion where you've got millions of people crossing into another country's borders, contrary to the laws of that country. That's an invasion, whether they're an armed, organized military force or not, still an invasion. And throughout history, there have been countless instances of things like this that were an invasion, regardless of whether there was a single state organizer of that activity, whether they were armed, whether they were organized as a military force. Why would he want to make it easier? But he did. You know, Remember the first week or two of the Biden administration, Secretary Mayorkas, who I believe had just been confirmed or maybe was about to be confirmed when he said this, some reporter asked him, what would you say to the migrants, the migrant caravans that were then making their way through Guatemala and into Mexico and across southern Mexico heading north? What would you say to them? And I don't remember the exact quote, but I, I think he uttered words to the effect that we probably won't be quite ready for them for another two or three weeks. We need a little bit more time to get ready. What is this? What does that mean? Why, why would you be that welcoming? Why, why not send the signal right then? Don't do it. It's not worth the risk to life and limb. It's not worth being indentured servants or sex slaves. It's not worth coming into this country contrary to our laws. And if you do that, we're going to send you back to Mexico, through which you will have crossed, to await an adjudication of your asylum claims. Why? Why do that? Why, why make that statement that he made? One can only conclude that this is what they wanted to do. They wanted to invite this invasion. They have nurtured it. They have fostered it. And over time, not only have they abandoned these safe third country programs, the Remain in Mexico program. They've adopted a particularly odd practice that years ago would have, if somebody had predicted this, I would have said that that's absolutely crazy. That had never happened. But they're given airplane tickets after they spend a few days being processed. They're told, okay, yeah, you came into our country in violation of our laws, but you've applied for asylum. You've applied for asylum, so we're going to let you in anyway, and we're going to give you an airplane ticket. We'll fly you to the U.S. city of your choice. By the way, you can get on that airplane, even though every American citizen has to show ID in order to get on one. You don't have to worry about that, as far as we're concerned. Um, just get on the plane, have fun. And uh, eventually they've started saying, by the way, within six months, we'll send you a, a work permit. You can use that work permit while you're here. Uh, all we ask is that when you get a notification that you're, it's time for your immigration hearing before an immigration judge to adjudicate the validity of your asylum claim, that you report to that, that you show up to that in person. And we're asking nicely, so we ask, ask that you do that. Oh, and by the way, many of you won't even have an immigration hearing before an immigration judge until the 2030s, possibly 2035. That's how insane this is. 
Why are we doing that? Once we started doing that, things really started heating up. The drug cartels realized this is the season. We're going to make a ton of money out of this. And they have. As anyone could have predicted, the border surges have increased dramatically. By the way, it bears noting here that our asylum laws don't give any one of these people, not a single one, a right to be here. There is not a statutory right. There is not a constitutional right that any particular immigrant has to receive asylum. It's not a right. It is a grant of authority to the executive branch of the U.S. government. It uses May language. If the following criteria for asylum are met, referred to those a minute ago, then the Secretary of Homeland Security may grant asylum uh, to such a person as meets those criteria. The, there is no language that says he shall, he must, only that he may. There are other laws that contemplate that, as I read them, require that people be detained while their asylum applications are pending. And they are detained, but these days it's for a few days. Then they're released with a plane ticket with the promise of a work permit, as I described a moment ago. But there isn't a right, not a statutory right, not a constitutional right, that any one of them has to be here. And so, you know, I, I, I would imagine that if Secretary Mayorkas were here, he would say, yeah, well, we don't detain them because we can't detain them because we ran out of bed space a long time ago. We're, we're so full. We're always so full. We don't really have the ability to detain them more than for just a few short days while we process them, and at least we know who they are. Then we release them. Why is that the solution? Why just release them and then give them a work permit and then tell them we hope that they'll act on good faith and go to their immigration hearing which may be more than a decade from now. Why? That makes no sense. When all along, the Secretary has the authority to shut down the asylum application process and say, we're not taking any more asylees. If you want asylum from the United States, apply from somewhere else. Go to a U.S. embassy in a foreign country, submit an application there, remain in that country or in some other country until such time as your asylum application can be adjudicated. But if you come in across our southern border, you will not be admitted. If we find you, we will deport you. And if you return again, that's a federal felony offense. You'll be imprisoned for years. Why isn't that the solution? These things would come to an abrupt halt if he did that, but he didn't. What did he do? Well, as as things heated up, he started looking for more and more creative ways to let people into the country. I won't bore you with all the details, but he re relied, among other things, on, on a, a feature of U.S. immigration law, a statutory provision known as um, parole authority. In the context of immigration, the immigration parole authority is there to be used on a case-by-case -case basis only, never to be used as on a categorical basis for a broad category of persons, but only for case-specific needs that are either that fall into one of two categories, either humanitarian, compassionate uh, uh, relief, or uh, public purpose. On the humanitarian or compassionate front, an individual can be admitted for a, a short duration. For example, if he or she is coming in to attend the funeral of a, of a family member with the expectation they'll go to the funeral, then they'll go back out. Or to attend to the needs of an acutely ill relative, something like that. On the public use front, that can be used for things like, uh, I don't know, if, if some government entity um, has need of, uh, for example, uh, interpreter services for an obscure language, 
they can't find a suitable interpreter in the United States, <clears throat> and so they look outside the United States. They can bring them in for that public use for some purpose related to uh, things like the aiding and assisting in government operations here. But the statutory framework makes very clear those are never to be used on a categorical basis. You can't just bring in large swaths of aliens simply by virtue of a common characteristic they have of being from this country or that country or well, the Biden administration, to make a long story short, has, I think in the last year or two alone, brought in about three million people under this parole authority. They've used that a lot. They've also resorted to uh, withheld removal. All these things are discretionary, by the way. There's nothing requiring the Department of Homeland Security to let these people in, but they do it anyway because they, they want to. And this problem becomes self-propelling, self-perpetuating, and self-magnifying. And our government's efforts to not enforce our border become self-defeating of the very purposes for which the Department of Homeland Security and its various agencies number of its agencies, at least, were, were created in the first place. So make no mistake, this is part of a deliberate choice. It's not something that was just out of our control that the U.S. government had no involvement in. There are people out there who have come up with all kinds of crazy theories to explain why this was inevitable, why this wasn't, uh, this had nothing to do with the Biden administration or any of its policies. I, I, if you believe that, I've got a bridge to sell you. It's just not plausible. There are those who are even claiming that this is somehow about climate change, that climate change forced them into our hands. Well, whatever caused them to want to make the dangerous journey north and to pay many thousands of dollars and in many case, cases um, subject themselves to forms of indentured servitude or slavery or sex trade doesn't mean that our country had to aid and abet in that. By the way, an, another of my colleagues just returned in the last few days from our southern border and was told something really alarming by the Border Patrol personnel there. As I understand it, they told them that the average time for those women and girls who can't afford the five, six, seven, eight thousand dollars, sometimes a lot more, they have to work it off. Now, both men and women are subjected to this indentured servitude. They can't pay it because a lot of these people can't pay it. These people are dirt poor. <clears throat> the drug cartels are taking advantage of those who are already vulnerable. They can't just go take out a line of credit somewhere. They can't just dip into their savings. They don't have, even if, they, even if they're paying the drug cartels at the very lowest rates, they still don't have that kind of money. So they have to work it off. My colleague was informed that the average period of time it takes for women and girls subjected to sex slavery as part of their indentured servitude, how they pay off the journey. It's like seven or eight years. And that one of the reasons it takes this long is that they're charged for everything <clears throat> while they're kept in these conditions against their will, held as captives. They're forced to pay room and board for their food, their housing, your clothing, there's even, um, you've got everything worked out to a fee schedule. There's even a, a, an established fee of, I believe, $30 that the cartels charge for the removal of an ankle monitoring bracelet. That's why it takes some, so long for them to work off this debt <clears throat> of a few thousand dollars that they paid for the cartels to smuggle them in. The work of these cartels in the human smuggling operations extends, of course, beyond human trafficking. 
in those humans whom they traffic and to whom they subject to these horrific conditions, conditions that we haven't seen and should never see in this country again since the Civil War. A lot of these, these conditions would never exist in this country but for the fact that we have a government that is facilitating it. It's not humane, it's not compassionate, it's not nice to invite and allow and perpetuate this kind of trade. It's corrupt, it's immoral, it's evil. But people do it because they're desperate and they believe that this gives them a chance. They're preying on vulnerable populations. As of December 10th, of just this last year. There were still 1,323,264 illegal aliens with final orders of removal who remained in the United States. Think about that one for a minute. In addition to the fact that we've not, now got millions of people, many millions, who have been released into the United States by our own government and told, we hope you'll show up to your immigration hearing before an immigration judge. By the way, that may not, probably won't, occur until the mid-2030s. But you can have a work permit between now and then, which you'll have within 180 days of your arrival at your destination, or at least that's when you can apply for it, and it will be granted it. On top of all of those people, we're so busy processing those, getting them to their destinations in the United States, that apparently we're not doing the removal. We're not executing on those who have been deemed deportable, removable, and, and therefore need to be removed from the country. Because we've got almost a million and a half people who have been ordered deported who are just out there on the streets. They're not doing that. That's why the failure to enforce the law begets more lawlessness, and that makes it harder and harder to enforce the law. That's why our whole system is built on what's supposed to be a never-ending succession of good men and women throughout each generation, across one generation to another, from regardless of political party, of the president in charge, people enforcing the law, because once you st stop enforcing it, <clears throat> especially in an area that involves immigration and illegal immigration and criminal activity accompanying illegal immigration in particular, it's very difficult. You can't just walk in and turn on a switch, turn it all around, because the backlog itself makes it so daunting. Meanwhile, the Department of Homeland Security placed only 6.8% of the illegal aliens encountered at the southwest border into proceedings to even be screened for asylum eligibility. So, as I said a few minutes ago, what started out as a predominantly asylum application-centered illegal immigration crisis has expanded expanded into something very different where they're not even doing the initial screening to find out whether they're going to claim asylum. They've stopped bothering with that. And they've started just <laughs> letting them in on other bases, like immigration parole, withheld removal, or something else. Of the at least 3.3 million illegal aliens released into the United States since January 20th, 2021, the Biden administration failed to remove through immigration court removal proceedings roughly 99.7% of those illegal aliens. Now look, for a system of laws to be enforced and uh, to be followed widely, there needs to be some, you know, you, you don't always have to catch, you know, app apprehend, charge, uh, in the case of illegal aliens, remove them or charge them if they've committed a crime. 
you don't have to get every single person who violated the law, but there does have to be a significant possibility of detection, of apprehension, and of consequence. But when you're looking at numbers like that, 99.7% don't have any consequence like that. Well, of course, it's going to continue. As of December 10, 2023, there were 1,323,264 aliens with final orders of removal, that is, deportation, who remained in the United States. And even though they are barely deporting anyone, apparently about 0.3% of illegal entrants, the Biden White House is threatening to stop all deportations if we don't pass the supplemental aid package for Ukraine. I don't even have words for that. And if I could think of words for that, it probably wouldn't be appropriate in my hometown of Provo, Utah. I, this is staggering. That President Biden would use this kind of threat. Well, according to the Supreme Court of the United States, it, the term is a legal matter. It doesn't apply as against the federal government. If this were anything outside of the U.S. government, we would call this. There's a word for this, and the word is extortion. Extortion occurs whenever somebody tries to get something out of you. They try to get something out of you by saying what they will or won't do that will end up being harm <clears throat> harmful to you. Others would describe it as, as blackmail. Either way, they're trying to Extortion is the word I would use because they're trying to get out of, he's trying to get out of Congress something that Congress is reluctant to do by leveling a threat. And the threat is, I'll enforce the border even less than I have been. I'll make this even more chaotic if you don't pass the Ukraine supplemental aid package. The Biden administration has removed only one illegal alien for every 26 illegal, illegal aliens it allowed to enter the United States. As of August 31st, 2023, the Department of Homeland Security had removed only 2% of illegal aliens who failed to appear, just those who failed to appear at their immigration court hearings after successfully establishing a fear of persecution at the border, which is the standard for claiming eligibility for asylum. 98% of those illegal aliens remained in the United States as of the end of August of last year, August of 2023. In fact, in, in early December 2023, Department of Homeland Security officials admitted that, quote, an average of 5,000 illegal aliens are currently being released into the United States each day at the border. And then throughout the month of December, we saw daily record after daily record being broken for those apprehensions, migrant encounters. Those are not the kinds of records we want to be breaking. We want to break records in the Olympics. We want to break records in areas that are signals that America is doing well, that it's healthy, that our government is serving its people well, or that Americans are able to thrive and, and succeed. This is not the kind of record to which we should aspire. And yet the Biden administration seems to want more of those records. It wants to spike the football and celebrate those. Although interspersed in all of this are some contradictory eyebrow-raising eyebrow expressions of momentary awareness that something is terribly wrong. I mean, even Secretary Mayorkas has acknowledged the high rate of releases, telling the Border Patrol that, quote, the current rate of release for illegal immigrants apprehended at the southern border is above 85 percent. I want to think that that is an acknowledgment that something's terribly wrong, but these days I don't know. I mean, his, his, his actions 
since we started raising, uh, 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 breaking those records, almost seemed to suggest that maybe he was bragging about that. So let's back up for a minute. We've talked about the circumstances when last fall some early discussions began after President Biden asked for another 16, 60 billion or, or so dollars to be sent to Ukraine. Those discussions among Senate Republicans in particular went something like this. Many of us are hearing from our constituents, and we ourselves share those concerns, that it seems wrong, vindictive toward our own citizens who we're, ask, who, whom we're asking to pay for this, our own citizens who are increasingly living paycheck to paycheck. The cost of living increases that are, have been the inevitable, foreseeable, in fact, foreseen and warned of consequences of Bidenomics. Coupled with Americans' understandable fear of, about who is coming across our borders illegally, from what countries and with what purposes in mind, with apparently not just the tacit acquiescence of our own government, but with the assistance of our own government, causes us to feel uneasy about this. Many Senate Republicans expressed legitimate concern that their own voters would be very unhappy with them if they just, under those circumstances, voted to support another $60 billion or so to support Ukraine when we've spent more on Ukraine than anybody else on military aid than everybody else combined. And at the same time, as we're doing all that to help Ukraine shore up its own border integrity, we're not doing anything for hours. So discussions ensued back and forth. Republicans came up with a, a nascent idea, a, more or less a plan. The idea was they say, look, um, there's pretty uniform support among Senate Democrats for more Ukraine aid. We've got a Democratic president in the White House. He really wants this. They tend to support him, and they do appear to support him on this. This is an issue that definitely unites Democrats, probably all 51 Democrats in the Senate, at least as we perceived it at the time, at least as it related to Ukraine aid. I still think that's true as to Ukraine aid. But it sharply divides Republicans. Some Senate Republicans, a minority of Senate Republicans, would have at the time perhaps been okay passing a Ukraine aid package without doing anything for our border. But most members of the Senate Republican Conference uh, didn't want to do that. Among House Republicans, House Republicans who, you know, only a third of us are up for re-election every year, but every member of the House of Representatives is up for re-election every year. The sentiment among House Republicans was, I, I believe, um, also one that included a lot of skepticism, a lot of skeptics such that it was unclear that you could get a Ukraine aid package passed through either House of Congress, much less both given that in the Senate, even though Democrats have the majority, and even though the Democrats uniformly support more aid to Ukraine, while only some um, Republicans do, uh, at least without qualification, without restriction, there was, in short, overwhelming support among Democrats for more Ukraine aid not among Republicans, but what Republicans do want, rather uniformly, is more border security. So we came up with this idea. Why not see if we can come up with a bill that would harness the appetite on the left for more Ukraine aid? 
in order to adopt legislative text that would, in effect, force an end to the border crisis, that would tie the Biden administration's hands to the point that the Biden administration uh, would have no choice but to enforce the border. And so the idea was hatched. Not everybody loved it, but most people thought it was a sensible approach to at least undertake. In theory, I, I think you get, if you wrote that bill right, uh, you could get a whole lot of Republicans on board, possibly even most of the Senate Republican conference. What ensued over the next um, two, three, four months, depending on where you measure it as having started, were a series of negotiations, and negotiations uh, from which nearly all Senate Republicans were excluded. We weren't permitted into that. Still don't entirely understand why. I mean, I, I, I do know that sometimes for a few days at a time, you've got to have chance for negotiators to negotiate and figure things out before they're ready to share language. But whenever someone is negotiating on behalf of 49 people, it is imperative to give them at least regular updates and share with them such text as, such statutory text as you're able to share as a draft for the bill. Unfortunately, we didn't see that. We didn't see anything beyond being told regularly we're trying to come up with a deal to get the best deal we can. We'll give you details as soon as we can. Uh, finally, in the second week of January, we were given a few bullet points, just a few bullet points, no legislative text. Based on those bullet points, a number of us expressed concern that unless there were more meat on the bones of this legislation, it wouldn't do what we as Senate Republicans thought we were committing to, what I think most of us thought we were committing to, which is it's not enough to go and negotiate a, a Ukraine aid package with a, an immigration bill tacked onto it. Just a few immigration reforms, even if they're, those immigration reforms are, um, include a few provisions that might help, that doesn't solve the issue here. They have to be sufficiently strong and unambiguous that it would more or less um, uh, force the issue uh, to the point where the, the president could no longer just facilitate the drug cartels in their business that makes them many tens of billions of dollars every year smuggling human traffic into the United States. And by the way, we know it's not just human traffic because those humans they're trafficking are also carrying other things, most notably enough fentanyl to kill every American if distributed in the right doses to the right number of people that have in fact killed more than 100,000 Americans for the last two or three years in a row. So yeah, when those details leaked out, but still without the benefit of seeing text, a number of us started to express concern. We started, not at that point, trying to kill the deal because there was no deal that we had seen. We had no ability to ascertain the full impact of it. We hoped that maybe, just maybe, there was something in there we weren't seeing. Maybe it was better than how it had been described to us, at least on the few details we got in, in the second week of January. The first time Senate Republicans were able to see the package was this past Sunday, almost a week ago. This past Sunday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, we received it not from our colleagues who have been involved in the negotiation, but from a reporter who apparently got to see it before we did and released it to the entire public. By the way, for le weeks leading up to this moment, before the bill, we were told, even existed, we did have a number of people in the media who had made up their minds. I don't know how they made up their minds on a bill that didn't yet exist, but, for example, 
The Wall Street Journal in the second week of January, it could have been the third, but I think it was the second week, published an editorial, an editorial backed by the whole editorial board, basically saying that any Republican who didn't support this deal, this border security deal coupled with Ukraine aid, was just trying to score cheap political points at the expense of border security and thus national security. I was shocked, dismayed, and yes, even offended by this. Because on the one hand, we were being told by our own Senate Republican leadership the bill didn't yet exist. That's why we couldn't see it, because it didn't exist yet. Nobody else got to see it, so we didn't either. If that was true, then the Wall Street Journal's editorial board, ordinarily cautious, careful, thorough, insightful, was just oper operating on rank speculation as to what might be in the bill. That's offensive. To insult us for not supporting a bill that we hadn't seen yet because it didn't exist yet and we wouldn't see for weeks. On the other hand, equally offensive, perhaps even more so, would have been the possibility that they had seen the bill. They were permitted an inside glimpse into what we would be forbidden from seeing for weeks to come. Either way, this is offensive. And it's not, um, it's not like the Wall Street Journal was the only source in the media. It's not like the Wall Street Journal was the other the only voice publicly clamoring for this and publicly chastising Republicans who would express concerns with it based on what few breadcrumbs they were allowed to receive about its contents, just bullet points, summaries of what might be in it. We finally did see it at 7 p.m. Eastern Time this last Sunday. I immediately devoted hours upon hours to reading it, as did members of my staff. It was 370 pages long. And in that 370 pages, there's a lot of detail, a lot of statutory cross-references. And while I, I respect and consider as friends those who have negotiated it, including and especially my friend James Lankford from Oklahoma, a good man, a dear friend, we agree on most things. I appreciate his work on this. It's not easy. I think he did the best job he could, could with the cards he was dealt. Nonetheless, it became increasingly apparent to me the more I read in this bill that it didn't live up, certainly to my expectations, about what we had agreed to, what I thought we had agreed to among Senate Republicans last fall, which was that if we were going to send another dime to Ukraine, we we really should do something that would force the end to the current border crisis. Now, sure, there, there were provisions in there, in that part of the bill, dealing with border security, that, that I can fairly characterize as an improvement. But I can certainly fairly characterize as tools that could be used in future administrations by future presidents and future Homeland Security secretaries and, and the agencies operating within that department to bring about a more secure border. But in each instance, I could find myriad ways in which this administration could, and I believe inevitably would, exploit loopholes within that legislative text were it to be passed into law to not only uh, avoid the more restrictive text, but in some cases even possibly to make it worse. It wasn't nearly enough. Much has been said about what those provisions would do. Less has been said about what they would not do. There was nothing in there that would have required 
a return to the Remain in Mexico program. There was nothing in there that would have prohibited the Biden administration from just putting people on planes to the destination of their choice within the United States and telling them, we hope you'll show up to your yet-to-be-scheduled, yet-to-be-dreamed-of uh, immigration judge hearing, which may not occur until 2035 or later. And by the way, we'll, you'll be eligible for a work permit within a mere 180 days. Didn't contain anything like that. Didn't can't contain anything reinforcing the authority of the president at any moment to go back to the Remain in Mexico program. In fact, he should have done it all along. That's why he litigated, and he lost that litigation. Nothing that required that. In fact, under certain circumstances, it allowed some aliens crossing into our borders without documentation, thereafter applying for asylum, to get work permits under the right circumstances without even having to wait the 180 days that they currently have to wait. It's things like this that may well have increased the draw, increased the allure of those willing to subject themselves to grave risks, to life, liberty, and property, to pay the drug cartels, to put themselves at the mercy of those vicious monsters who engage in human trafficking and trafficking of controlled substances across multiple international borders. If anything, this would have increased the appeal of that because they could have gotten work permits without having to wait the 180-day period for this, at least for certain classes of individuals coming in this way. So a number of us, after reading it, said this is not what we agreed to. This was not part of the plan. This isn't what we wanted. And while we appreciate the hard work that Senator James Langford put into it on our behalf, and I, I believe he was acting um, selflessly and, and again, uh, dealing with um, a really tough hand he had been dealt. This is the inevitable, foreseeable, and avoidable consequence of what happens when, whenever you're forced to negotiate something on behalf of 49 people without what would ordinarily be assumed would be customary, would be just a matter of collegiality to keep them updated and informed as to what you were negotiating on their behalf. I, again, I don't mean to suggest any bad faith on his part. I think he was acting within very, very tough parameters. I raise that only to explain that it's not surprising that over a two, three, four month period, from concept to proposal, when people are not informed and there's not able to be the, the more or less um, continual feedback between the negotiator and those on whose behalf he's negotiating, when they're not able to communicate regularly about the contents of the deal, you run a grave risk that that deal is going to be pretty far apart from what people expected. And so a lot of us came out right away and said, I've got concerns with this. The Senate Republican Conference met um, less than 24 hours after that bill was released at 6 p.m. on Monday. By the end of that meeting, we were starting to surmise that this bill wasn't going to make it, that uh, there wasn't support for it. And in the end, there's only four Republican senators who supported that iteration of the Ukraine aid bill. That is, the Ukraine aid bill with the border security immigration provisions tacked onto it. Just four. Four out of 49 Senate Republicans voted to even end debate on the narrow question of proceeding to that bill. So yes, that, that is itself proof positive 
that something had gone dangerously wrong between the moment we first discussed and negotiated out the kind of the understanding or the agreement that we had among Senate Republicans as to what we wanted to accomplish and as to what was accomplished. But in no way, shape, or form did that failure to satisfy expectations, that pretty significant departure from expectations, overtake, supersede, obviate the need for, much less erase the concerns of Senate Republicans and those we represent, and some many hundreds of millions of Americans who are concerned about the full-scale invasion being carried out, unfolding across our southern border with massive, dire ramifications for the humanitarian needs of those individuals. It didn't undo our concerns. It didn't undo the whole reason we had reached this agreement. And therefore, many, if not most of us, who had these concerns started saying, look, um, the fact that this won't do the job, this won't secure the border, this doesn't make it sufficiently more likely that the border will be enforced and that this crisis will come to an end during this administration. The fact that we don't feel good about this bill doing that doesn't mean that we're enthusiastic about simply providing our votes to fund Ukraine to the tune of another 55 or $60 billion. It shouldn't do that. It doesn't do that. And so, for the same reasons that we decided months ago, I believe it was all 49 of us to oppose cloture on the motion to proceed to an earlier version of this bill, actually a shell of an earlier version of this bill, one that involved only uh, these foreign military aid and non-military aid issues. The same reasons are still alive today. So a lot of us started suggesting that we should deny cloture on the motion to proceed, not only to that bill, but also to what was put forward as the text of the original bill, or what was to become the original bill, which was just the foreign supplemental aid package without the border security. And for those of us who, in the first instance, said we don't want to fund Ukraine again without securing our, our own border, and then said all but four of the 49 Senate Republicans said that border security package added to the Ukraine deal doesn't satisfy our concerns. That shouldn't have meant, okay, let's just have Republicans supply the votes now to get this passed. Now, something we all have to remind ourselves about, about Senate procedure. Legislation, absent unusual circumstances like a veto override or ratification of a treaty, for example, involving a two-thirds supermajority vote as required by the Constitution, absent special circumstances like that, Passage of legislation in the Senate is by a simple majority. 51 votes out of 100 could be less than that, uh, depending on who's here and how many senators we have at the time. But in order to get to final passage, in all but a very narrow set of circumstances that are seldom at play, uh, circumstances involving a rarely used procedure known as budget reconciliation, not present here. All legislation before it can be passed into law has to uh, endure multiple cloture votes. And cloture is a, an old-fashioned Senate-specific word that we use that involves bringing debate to a close. And it takes 60 votes to bring debate to a close. It takes 60 votes to bring debate to a close regardless of how many people are are present at, at the moment. It requires um, the support of um, three out of every five senators uh, who, who were in place at the time. 
We've got 100 senators. That means 60 votes, regardless of how many are here. That's what you have to do in order to bring debate to a close. And you have to bring debate to a close multiple occasions. Normally, um, you'll see this in multiple respects, at least two, sometimes more, depending on whether you're dealing with a substitute amendment or something like that. But you'll, at a minimum, have, um, in most circumstances, to bring debate to a close prior to the motion to proceed to the bill before you're formally considering it. And then you'll have cloture on the bill, bringing debate to a close at the end of that process. Either way, it takes 60 votes. What that means is that the whole reason this bill, the version of the bill that included the border security language, the whole reason that failed is because they couldn't get to 60. Couldn't get to 60 votes on that one. As I mentioned a moment ago, the Ukraine aid, I think, has tended in the past to unify all 51 Democratic votes in the Senate. As this was brought forward, I believe they had one dissenting Democrat um, earlier this week on the combined um, foreign aid supplemental package and the uh, border security provisions. It one dissenting Democrat, as I recall. So that means with 50 Democrats supporting it, you'd have to get 10 Republicans or this thing couldn't go anywhere. You, you received four Republicans who supported cloture on the motion to proceed to that bill with one Democrat uh, also opposing cloture. So you had 54 votes, six shy of the 60 you needed. So that part was finished. Then they had another cloture vote, another vote on cloture on the motion to proceed. the supplemental aid package without the border security language. Interestingly, you had, I believe it was 17 Republicans who voted for that. The same people, most of whom had just voted against the border security language being included. And as I recall, all 17 of those, as I recall last fall when we made this decision, I thought we were united on this point that um, we needed to try to force through legislation that would uh, compel the president, leaving him no easy out to actually secure the border. I thought that's what the plan was. Maybe some never were on board with that altogether, but it just makes no sense to me that what we were, as a whole conference, against just a few months ago, they voted for this week even though there's now nothing in there to secure the border. Now, we could have, should have, instead come up with this simple set of things. We maybe should have done that even last fall, though the need for it has become even more pronounced ever since then. To just say, okay, um, we know a, a border security deal that could passed the House of Representatives, because it has passed the House of Representatives. And we know that I believe all 49 Republicans have been supportive in other contexts of this bill passed by the House of Representatives in the border security context, called H.R. 2, or at least the essential elements of it. We could have added that to it, maybe added a um, couple of other provisions, or maybe not, and just put that forward. H.R. 2 would make a big difference. It would really tie the administration's hands and make it much more difficult for the administration to continue being an active accomplice in this um, full-scale invasion taking place across our southern border that, according to many, has let in 10 million people or so, maybe more, just since January 20th, 2021. Why didn't we do that? Many of us suggested, again, even this week, and it's been suggesting from the beginning that we add language there. Then a number of my colleagues made another, uh, another suggestion at the time. Why not, in addition to H.R. 2, why don't we add something just to make sure that this actually happens? It would require 
the Biden administration to achieve certain border security metrics, to achieve a secure border, to, to achieve actual operational security of the uh, operational control of the border as defined by law before all the Ukraine aid could be released. Many, if not most, Republican senators ended up echoing that belief. I believe I first heard it suggested by my friend and colleague from North Dakota, Senator John Hoven, himself a former governor, a governor of a border state, albeit a northern border state. Dynamics up there are a little bit different. Had we done something like that, I think that could have and should have been able to unite at least nearly all Senate Republicans. To my knowledge, it would have. We'd be in a much better position if we had a package supported by Republicans that were supported by most Republicans. Instead, what we've gotten is something that has become far too common these days. And I take no joy in describing it this way circumstances in which our own Senate Republican leadership is tragically chosen to support legislation that unites all or nearly all Senate Democrats while sharply dividing Republicans. It doesn't, almost doesn't even capture it. Not just sharply dividing Republican senators, but securing the, you know, anywhere from nine to sometimes 19 or 20 Republican votes to join with Democrats to advance Democratic policy overwhelmingly favored and championed by Democrats that most Republicans in the Senate and in America overwhelmingly oppose. This is far from the only example of this happening, far from the only example of this happening even throughout the duration of the Biden presidency far from the over only example of this happening then or in the prior administration or in other administrations since I've been a United States Senator, since I became a United States Senator in 2011. Why does our own Senate Republican leadership sometimes try so hard to get a handful of Republicans, a minority of Republican Senators, to join in an effort that unites most, or in many cases all, Senate Democrats on an issue so aggressively opposed by most Republicans in the Senate and in America, if not most Americans themselves. I don't know that I can fully answer that question, but I don't know that I need to here because I know, but it, what I do know is that it's, it's happening here. When you saw 17 Republicans at the urging of Senate Republican leadership joining with a near unanimous Senate Democratic caucus to advance a bill important to President Biden that overwhelmingly is supported by Democrats. And yes, some Republicans do support it, but it's, it's a slim minority of them among Americans, even more of a slim minority among um, Republicans at large than it is among Senate Republicans, but it's still a slim minority among Senate Republicans. Why do we do this? We shouldn't. We certainly shouldn't here, not where our own border security presents such a clear and present threat to American national security. One of the things that I find so galling and so difficult to accept, much less understand, is the fact that we're told by our few Republican pug colleagues who aggressively support this bill, we have to support it, that they support it, because our own national security depends on it. That's hard for me to understand. And I, I, I genuinely do like to understand other people's arguments when addressing them. As a lawyer, it was my job to thoroughly understand my opponent's argument. Nothing works as well if you don't understand your opponent's argument. And when you understand it, the, the debate can become crystallized. It can become clearer. It's hard to understand it here because it's hard to understand a coherent defense of it, especially when they're telling us 
that the war in Ukraine and our ability to fund it is kind of a without which not component of our national security. Even though we would have the ability, if we held off for a while, and if we said, you know, to our Democratic colleagues, with all due respect, we do need to present you with another option. We presented something that actually would secure the border in meaningful ways. You'll get enough Republican votes to move forward. If you do this, you, 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 you won't get those votes if you don't. It seems a much better way forward than for us to claim that we're going to do that, only to not do that at the end of the day. And the first sign of trouble of a border security deal that failed to secure the border, to our satisfaction, 17 of our Republican colleagues joined with the Democrats and abandoned the commitment that I thought we had made a few months ago to each other and to our voters, to the American people generally. It's baffling. It's troubling. But more importantly, Madam President, it's not too late. It still isn't done. We haven't passed the bill. We can still tomorrow, we, uh, 1 p.m. tomorrow, we're scheduled to vote on cloture on the bill. That is bringing debate to a close on the bill. If enough of those Senate Republicans changed their position between now and then and voted against cloture on the bill, then we could have a chance again to say, let us take another shot at it. We can come up with language probably in a few days that we could propose that I think could unite at least nearly every Republican in the Senate. Maybe not everyone, but probably 80 or 90 percent of us easily, as opposed to a bill that they seem inclined to support that most Republicans in the Senate and in the country strongly oppose. I hope that they'll reconsider, especially when they learn and are apprised of the feelings of their constituents about this, especially as their constituents learn about some of the details of this bill. So let's, let's talk about a few of those details now, considering as we now have the backdrop of this legislation, how we got here, and why it is that Senate Republicans overwhelmingly oppose this bill and why it is that that is quite arguably inconsistent with the commitment that Senate Republicans have made to each other and to the public, um, that 17 of them have now seem to have indicated that they're, they're not supportive of. So what remains of the bill? Let's talk about that for a moment. Among its many other features among the many tens of billions of dollars that it sends to Ukraine. There are a few provisions that I feel the need to highlight here. One provision uh, it gives $238 million, so close to a quarter of a billion dollars, for increased U.S. troop deployments to Europe. What does that mean? Well, not sure, but I'm pretty sure it has a lot to do with the conflict in Ukraine and other things surrounding it. Does this mean, could this mean that we're preparing to involve ourselves more directly, more kinetically in the war between Ukraine and Russia? Whereas up to this point, we've been acting through a proxy, Ukraine. If so, the Senate ought to begin debates on an authorization for the use of military force or a declaration of war to that effect, but we haven't. So why then are we deploying so many troops there? Well, the skeptic, the cynic could argue that whenever we do that, whenever we deploy U.S. military personnel to a, into a zone of hostilities or into a, a zone in which hostilities appear to be imminent, based on the circumstances. We're more or less acknowledging that what any of us would consider actions tantamount to warfare are, if not inevitable, somewhat likely. 
So when we increase our troop deployments into that area, perhaps anticipating that that war may spill over or that we might become more further and more directly involved, or to an area where we've got covering more of a surface area where there's a bigger target on us, at that moment, we become a little bit more committed, a little bit more likely to go to war. We put them there if they do things that impact our troops, our U.S. military personnel, as various Iranian proxies in the region, in and around the Middle East, have done in recent weeks, we become that much more likely to be involved in armed conflicts. See, when they fire on our people, the president has some immediate authority to, to, to repel an attack as it's occurring. Or <clears throat> that, in turn, can quickly lead into full-scale warfare. We ought to be having more of those discussions. Instead, we're just spending more money, quietly sending more troops there. I don't think that gets enough airtime. Different people might have different feelings about the extent to which we ought to be involved in that conflict, but we're not having them. And this is a conflict, after all, that involves some major adversaries that could involve not only Russia, but Iranian proxies and ultimately Iran. And all this has been stirred up at about the same time. We ought to be concerned about that. We ought to be having conversations about where that can take us, and we're not. It also allows an additional $7.8 billion worth of weapons to leave U.S. military stockpiles immediately. Now, keep in mind, we're still looking at years before those stockpiles are fully replenished. And if we have to engage elsewhere, let's say if we have to engage in the Indo-Pacific region in the near future, for example, if Beijing were to attack Taiwan and we needed to, wanted to supply Taiwan with weapons that it could use to deter that action, to make it less likely. We're making it through this action that much more difficult for us to do that, because I'm told that many of the same weapons According to a number of foreign policy and military experts, people like my friend Elbridge Colby have pointed out that a lot of the same weapons that are being given to Ukraine now are the same weapons, the same types of weapons and weapon systems that would be needed in Taiwan to deter an attack on Taiwan from Beijing. So that ties our hands there. Some would also add that um, a lot of those same weapons are the same things at least in some cases, needed in Israel, by Israel. And yet, we're giving up an additional $7.8 billion worth of this stuff. Now, <clears throat> it'd be one thing, it'd still be significant given the cost, it'd be one thing if we could just turn on a switch and say, make more of these weapons. Weapons with names like Javelins, Attackums, HIMARS, uh, among many, many others. If we could just flip a switch and say, make more of those. It's not really how it works. This stuff is really sophisticated. It's really complicated. And some predict that we may not be able to replenish our stockpiles until the 2030s. In some cases, um, until many of the people entering our borders unlawfully today might have their ultimate immigration judge hearing. And well after the time in which many people fear Beijing might be most tempted to make a move on Taiwan. But even more concerning, we don't know what other threats the U.S. might be facing over the next, I don't know, decade or so. There may be other threats to our national security out there, threats we might not even be focused on right now. 
might require those for the use and by our military forces in protecting the American homeland. When we release this many of these very sophisticated, complicated, tough weapons, which, you know, together with the bravery of the best uh, men and women any military could have that we have in the United States, we also have achieved a degree of military success and prowess, not only because of the bravery and the expertise and the knowledge and the dedication and the patriotism of our brave men and women who serve in uniform, but also because we've developed a, a really impressive arsenal of weapons, unmatched classes of weapons that have helped bring safety and security to the United States. And in, a way that we've all benefited from in a meaningful, material way. What happens, though, when we run out of those, when we've given them to other countries to such a degree, at such a pace, that we can't produce them fast enough, will we find ourselves flat-footed, unable to protect the American homeland? The fact that that question hasn't really been asked, much less answered, to my satisfaction, ought to concern all of us. It ought and I'm not the only one asking the question. This needs to be discussed more than it is. It's for this reason that <clears throat> this legislation even has to include that language to begin with. We have existing law, and background legislation in place long before this war started between Russia and Ukraine, at least the current one. Provides that absent uh, Congress passing legislation saying otherwise. The President has a maximum of $100 million of what they call presidential drawdown authority, that he can draw down, exist down, existing caches of weapons, uh, ammunition, things like that, $100 million without additional permission from Congress. So we've increased that threshold 78-fold in this one provision. There is a good reason why we have the $100 million presidential drawdown authority cap, a very good reason indeed. And that reason has a lot to do with not wanting to leave the United States flat-footed by a president who chooses, perhaps short-sightedly, to give too many of our weapons away. So we're, we're multiplying that limit by 78 times. At a moment when we've already given even more than that, to Ukraine at a time when our weapons cache of all kinds of weapon systems that we need to rely on have been depleted substantially. This is scary. We should be concerned. So it's not just that this bill doesn't protect American national security on the homeland by fixing the border crisis and ending the invasion. It's that it also depletes our weapons and makes us less able to protect our homeland and our allies when needed. This bill also allows the Department of Defense to enter into contracts for $13.7 billion in new equipment for Ukraine through the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative. This with no requirement whatsoever for the Biden administration, for the Pentagon, to prioritize contracts that are necessary for our own readiness. In other words, the Biden administration is free under this legislation, as it may choose and as it's widely expected to choose, to prioritize this new series of weapons contracts to the tune of $13.7 billion for Ukraine over weapons procurement needed to protect the American homeland. That's concerning. That ought to worry the American people. The bill also funds U the Ukrainian National Police and, get this, the Ukrainian State Border Guard to the tune of $300 million. Just let that sit for a minute. $300 million going to protect Ukraine's border 
to the Ukrainian National Police and to the Ukrainian State Border Guard, while the Biden administration refuses to enforce and secure our borders. Is this a good idea? Oh, it's a great idea. If you're Ukraine, and, and make no mistake, I want, I want Ukraine to win. I want Ukrainians to be free. I bear them no ill will, but this is a really good deal for them. It's much less of a good deal for the United States and for the American people. This ought to be concerning to every one of us, Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, Independent, whatever you are. This ought to worry you more than just a little bit. Here's another galling feature. This legislation ensures that Ukrainian bureaucrats, rest assured, won't miss a paycheck, not a single one, for the next year. Courtesy of $7.8 billion in budget support from U.S. taxpayers. So we'll be paying their, well, meeting their entire government payroll. My understanding is it's for an entire year. No questions asked, courtesy of the American people. Courtesy of the American people, while their own people, the Americans, funding this through their hard-earned taxpayer dollars and through the corresponding increases in the price of everything they buy, from housing to health care, from gas to groceries and everything else, that on top of their already hefty tax bill, is paying for this. Now, that's great. I'm happy for them that their paychecks will be secure. But what about the American people? Isn't our first job to do no harm to them? Isn't our first job to make sure that when we fund somebody else's priority, we take care of our own first? And if those two are incompatible, we side with our own people, with our own homeland? I Call me crazy, but I always thought that was sort of how it should work around here and how it would work, how it typically worked in the past. But this seems crazy to me. I, again, getting back to the idea of selecting people randomly out of voter registration rolls, or if phone books still exist, out of a phone book. I think most Americans would be really surprised, and not in a good way, upon learning facts like these about how this is going to impact American national security. I would think they certainly wouldn't want us to rush this through without adequate opportunity to debate this under the light of day in front of the American people with a full opportunity to offer amendments, perhaps to clarify a few points. Sure, I, I'm not wild about this bill. I make no secret about that. It is still Nonetheless, uh, my right procedurally and my obligation morally to try to make the bill better, to try to make it inure more to the benefit of the American people than it currently does and less to their detriment. Shockingly, a number of my colleagues, and, and, and right now I'm speaking just of Republican colleagues, this isn't even uh, about Democrats, but a number of my Republican colleagues have said in recent days Things that suggest that they don't think those of us who have concerns with the bill, who are, as they put it, never going to vote for this bill anyway, that we shouldn't get to decide what's in it. We shouldn't have the opportunity to review it, to debate at length, and much, much less to amend it. I'm sorry, I, I find that one really difficult to take, especially from fellow Republican senators. There's absolutely nothing in the rules of the Senate or of any legislative body that I know of, any civilized nation on earth or in the history of time that says that unless you're going to swear to support the finished product no matter what's in it, that you can't support amendments to it, that you shouldn't be allowed to fully debate it and adequately have the opportunity to introduce and vote on amendments to improve it. It is our obligation. And I find it shameful that any member of this body would say that. I find it especially troubling that Republicans, particularly the slim minority of Republicans who have chosen to unite Democrats, sharply divide Republicans on a policy that it is embraced 
by the Democratic Party and overwhelmingly opposed by Republicans would say that to a fellow Republican standing up for what most Republicans in this body and in America believe. This has become far too common. It's not the first time I've heard that argument, which is not only uncollegial, it's unpatriotic, it's incompatible with our system of government. And I look forward to the day when that argument will no longer even be raised by members of this body because it's completely contrary to the cause of good government. The bill also um, contains funding to the tune of billions of dollars that can be used for all sorts of things, all sorts of economic aid-related purposes out of the $7.8 billion in economic assistance. It can be used for all sorts of things and has been used in the past in previous iterations of it to subsidize things like clothing stores, Ukrainian clothing stores, and um, to buy concert tickets for people going to concerts in Ukraine. All while families living here in the United States are living paycheck to paycheck and not having their government fund their clothing stores or buy their concert tickets. The fact that that wasn't excluded from this bill, when we know that things like that have been an issue, is insulting to the American people. This legislation begins uh, Ukrainian reconstruction using U.S. dollars. In this bill, it's, it's $25 million for the transition initiatives account at uh, the U.S. agency known as USAID for, quote, frontline in newly liberated communities reclaimed from Russian occupation. Now, <clears throat> trying to figure out how, how best to put this, but the, at once one could, could say uh, that's only $25 million. In the grand scheme of this bill and in the grander scheme of what Congress spends in any given year or in, in the grand scheme of U.S. GDP, yeah, that's, that can appear like a drop in the bucket, but that $25 million didn't come from nowhere. It came right off the bottom line of poor middle-class Americans. Again, the wealthy can absorb something like this. In many circumstances, the wealthy even grow richer still under the yoke of inflation that's crippling to poor middle-class Americans. The kind of inflation that... $25 million here, $7.8 billion there, $13.5 billion there. You throw those numbers around before long, it really does start to, to add up, and it becomes part of the $34 trillion in debt that we've accumulated, which within this year or perhaps next, at the latest, we'll be paying interest at the rate of a trillion a year. Yes, we'll soon see America spending more on interest on our national debt than on defense, itself creating one of the greatest threats to American national security that we've ever known. And we've done it ourselves here because of things like this, bit by bit. Well, I'm sure those, those um, reclaimed communities in, in Ukraine, the people who live there, the frontline and newly liberated communities in, in Ukraine, I'm sure they will be happy with this. I'm sure they are good, decent, freedom-loving people who just want to live and be free and they want a chance to restart their lives, and my heart goes out to them. This is not to say that anyone who benefits from this is undeserving or, or bad. What I'm saying is that where does this end? If you accept the premise that this is only $25 million, let's examine that for a minute. Separate and apart from the fact that, as I've just mentioned, that's a lot of money for the people who have to pay for it. But if it really is only $25 million, meaning it's only $25 million now, but we're setting a predicate now that apparently we're going to be responsible for reconstruction throughout Ukraine. It's going to be our responsibility from half a world away to fund and oversee reconstruction of territory reclaimed as it's reclaimed, liberated 
from Russian control. Why, again, is this us rather than the Ukrainian people? Why is this us rather than Ukraine's neighbors? Especially when we've already given so much more than any of them, or in some cases, all of them combined for the military aid. Why is this us, and why are we setting this predicate now? You'd almost have to strain with a magnifying glass to find those communities on a map in Ukraine that will be affected by this. And I think that's why this is, quote unquote, only $25 million. But we set that predicate now. What's this going to amount to? If what we hope to see, which is Ukraine winning this war and more and more communities um, being liberated, are we in charge of all those too? This bill would seem to set that predicate. That's concerning. How has this gone elsewhere when we put ourselves in charge of nation building in countries a half world away? It hasn't ended well. And in many cases, it ends up funding all the wrong things. We ought to be concerned about this. The legislation asks for a multi-year strategy for Ukraine that places the United States at the helm of things like I just mentioned, things like the $25 million uh, reconstruction plan, for lack of a better word, is a gift to these woke and complacent European allies who refuse to own the responsibility of securing their continent, of securing their own backyard. They'd rather have us do it because they know we're just crazy enough to hit the printing presses rather than to ask them to carry their share of the burden, which should be much, much greater than ours, given that we went first, we've already given an extraordinary sum, and it's a half a world away, whereas this is at their doorstep. And we've been carrying a disproportionate share of all of their security burdens for decades anyway. The bill blatantly acknowledges that the nearly $10 billion of humanitarian aid in the bill may very well be diverted by Hamas or perhaps other terror groups in Gaza. And I believe two different accounts that add up to between nine and $10 billion. There's Ukraine laid out, I believe the language is something to the effect of in or around Ukraine and in and around Israel. These two accounts that when added together come up to somewhere between nine and $10 billion. Nothing in there that um, restricts that aid in a way that we can be certain won't end up helping Hamas. In fact, we can be quite confident that it will. Based on past practice, based on what we've learned from other parts of the world, and based on the fact that it's hard for us to relate to what they face in Gaza. But to say, yeah, we're going to send up to 9 or $10 billion to humanitarian aid, which, as far as we know, this administration has discretion under this legislation, such that if it is passed, we have to assume there's at least a possibility that they devote all or nearly all, or at least a substantial portion of those funds to humanitarian relief in Gaza. Now, I'm sure we will hear, not if, but when that happens, don't worry. Have no fear. This is only going to people in Gaza. It is not going to Hamas or any other terror group. It's difficult for us to imagine a world like Gaza from our comfortable, secure, heaven-blessed land where we don't live like that. But to describe it as a dictatorship doesn't capture it. That implies the existence of an organized state. It's so much worse than that. It's that the entire country lives under the iron, brutal, punishing, threatening, retaliatory, bloodthirsty iron fist of this, of this organization, Hamas. 
It is not possible. You cannot send aid to there and say, don't worry, it won't go to Hamas. I, it, it's hard even to think of, of, of an analogy that, that captures it. I mean, it, it, it would be more defensible to say we're, we're going to send $10 billion to the United Kingdom, but don't worry, it will not end up, none of it will end up in the hands of the British. It's not pl plausible. But that's a gross understatement compared to the reality of this. Hamas is Gaza, and Gaza is Hamas. You send humanitarian aid there, you will be supporting them, just as other aid packages approved by this administration and by international bodies to which we are huge contributors. I've spent countless billions of dollars sending there, and that has been used by Hamas well, it was supposed to go to humanitarian relief. It's been used by Hamas to prepare for and execute this horrific attack that we saw on October 7th. A horrific attack that according to, the, to those in Gaza, according to Hamas itself, is just a preview of much bigger, grander, more ambitious, more bloodthirsty plans to come. The bill also perpetuates the cycle of endless and unconstitutional wars in the Middle East, bought and paid for by the United States. We get involved in these things. We stir up trouble. We arm those who we perceive to be our allies, not knowing how long they might be our allies or to what extent they might actually be our allies. We're assuming that just because we consider their them our allies today, that they won't turn against us tomorrow, or that they will necessarily use what we give them to our own people's benefit. It encourages escalating conflicts in the region to the tune of $2.4 billion, risking direct engagement with Iran. Look, we have a crisis of never-before-seen proportions on our southern border, and we're doing all of this, stirring up other conflicts, making them more likely to end up impacting Americans and America's brave men and women in uniform. And so it saddens me to recall that Republicans just in very recent months demanded meaningful border security, specifically the House passed Secure the Border Act, known as H.R. 2. and perhaps other provisions demanded by a majority of Senate Republicans suggesting that Ukraine aid ought to, ought to be made contingent on President Biden utilizing those resources in H.R. 2, for example, or under existing law, as he could do and should do, and by law is required to do, before the Ukraine aid is released notwithstanding the fact that Republican after Republican insisted that on that, um, the lead Republican negotiator was, we learned recently, instructed not even to raise the issue. Even though, by my count, most Senate Republicans liked the idea. It's inexplicable. We demanded that as a condition for supporting more aid to Ukraine. We didn't get it. What they produced didn't do what it was supposed to do, which is make it much, much harder for the Biden administration to continue to facilitate the ground invasion taking place at our southern border over the last three years. We waited for months <clears throat> with no meaningful news on the negotiations, no, apparently no input that was really heard and embraced into the negotiations and, and no confirmed details or legislative language until less than six days ago. The border package produced by the sponsors of this bill did not secure the border. 
It contained other features that perhaps in future administrations might prove helpful at the margins, but it also contained a lot of things that, that an administration, whether it's this one or one in the future, bent on not securing the border might use to, to a, its great advantage in keeping the border open. So it didn't harness, as it was supposed to, the bipartisan, the, the, the overwhelming democratic support for more Ukraine aid in order to use that support on the democratic side as leverage for actually making the border more secure in this administration. It didn't do that. So that's why we said this one won't suffice. Let's offer up something that actually will. But as you know, that it doesn't offer any real consequence when you say that, unless you're willing to walk away from the deal. And because just enough Senate Republicans, well, a little more than uh, just enough, but a minority, a slim minority of Senate Republicans, just 17, decided to support this bill that we as a conference said a few months ago we wouldn't support without something forcing border security. Because they came back and said, never mind, we'll do it anyway, even though we said beforehand we won't. Because they did that, of course the Democrats don't want to negotiate something that would force border security. I wish they would. They should. It shouldn't be a bipartisan. Uh, it should be a bipartisan issue. It shouldn't be deeply partisan, wanting to secure the border. But for whatever reason, they feel that way. And so given that they feel that way and want to support this administration's lawless approach to, to our southern border, of course, they're going to take the lowest price that they can get Republican support for. And if 17 Republicans are willing to give them that support, without anything forcing border security in this administration as a condition for their ability to fund Ukraine aid, then of course they're going to take the easier path. Why would they do anything else? That part makes sense. What I can't understand is why Republicans would do this. Why would Republicans, having taken, having taken that stand, do an about-face and say, oh, never mind. It's as though we walked in to a car dealership saying, we want to buy this car. But we won't pay more than this price for it. And later, when the dealer didn't accept the deal, we, I say we, those speaking for Senate Republican leadership said, never mind, we want to buy the car. We don't care the price. We don't care what concessions you give us on our end. We'll take the original high price with little on it for us. We'll take that deal. When you go into a car dealership and say, I will pay any price for this, even if it's a, an exorbitantly high price, you're not going to get a great deal. And that's what happened here. It really is unfortunate. Madam President, my, my Democratic colleagues and many in the corporate media have made a great show of pretending that just, just because we were given a so-called deal, a deal that contained the word border in it, that our demands for real border security have been met. This is laughable. It's laughable nonsense, in fact as the language of that bill showed. I don't mean that every provision of it was, was laughable, and I don't mean this is an insult to those who negotiated it, who I, whom I like and respect on a personal level, and with whom I've worked on, on other projects. But I mean it's laughable, it's laughably incompatible with and an unresponsive to the demands that we made, the deal that we made with each other and with the American people, 
as the language of that bill showed. And as the American people's reaction to that bill also confirmed. If our colleagues would truly secure the borders, I would love to give them the opportunity to do so. The chance to do so right now wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily fix everything, but it should go a long way toward fixing the problem. It would force a material change, a material en enhancement in border security. I'm, I'm proud to introduce the Stopping Border Surges Amendment, which would make discreet, common sense changes to our immigration law to protect our border. It would prevent traffickers from using toddlers and babies as a means to ensure their customers' easy admission into the interior of our country. It would allow minors from any nation, if they do not have a credible fear of persecution, to be safely returned to their home country. It would expedite the hearing process for children trafficked across the border, often used as chattel, temporary chattel, just for the benefit of those trying to cross illegally. It requires, it would require, if enacted into law, asylum seekers to apply for asylum in at least one safe country on their route to the United States. It would help eliminate the overwhelmingly fraudulent asylum claims that we see being brought. It would require asylum seekers to arrive and present themselves at a point of entry. And it would expand the time from claiming asylum to receiving a work permit, which would help curb the incentive to come here illegally. And so, uh, Madam President, I ask unanimous consent to set aside all pending amendments and motions and to make my amendment, Lee number 1531, pending to the text of Murray number 1388. Is there objection? Madam President. The Senator from Illinois. Madam President, I object. Objection is heard. Oh, yeah, there we have it. And keep in mind, we're all, what you just witnessed is made a motion not to pass this into law, not even a motion to accept this as an amendment into the text. I just asked for consent to call up the amendment and make it pending so that it could be one of the items that we considered. One of the matters to be voted on, one of the matters that we'd at least have the opportunity to consider and debate on, hopefully ultimately vote on, and ultimately resolve. But I guess that was too much. As um, my friend and colleague from Illinois, acting um, undoubtedly at the direction of the Senate Democratic leadership, made an objection even to, to calling that up and to make the amendment pending. This is what the rules of the Senate, that are more than two centuries old, have evolved over, over time, but uh, this is what they're there to do. All these odd terms like cloture, um, all these procedural votes that we have, they're really designed to maximize the opportunity for each individual senator to make sure that we have robust debate and to consider possible improvements made to a bill. In the past, this um, wasn't such a difficult thing to do. I've been in the United States Senate for 13 years now, arrived in 2011. And at the time, you know, things weren't perfect by any means, but at the time it was fairly common when we were considering a major piece of legislation, or even a, some relatively minor pieces of legislation, while that Legislation was pending during time set aside to debate the measure. It was quite commonplace. It was considered a, a routine practice that members could go down, go down to the floor,
call up their amendment and make their amendment pending. It didn't guarantee passage of their amendment into law. It didn't guarantee that their amendment would be adopted into the legislative text for final consideration along with the underlying legislation. No, it just meant that it could be made pending so that senators could have an opportunity to debate it, discuss it, ultimately vote on it, or maybe have it fall with a motion to table in the event it was a germane amendment could still be considered after cloture if it were not germane, meaning tightly connected to the bill. A good example of a, an obviously germane or a very likely germane amendment is one that just strikes a provision that's in there. Um, you could still get a vote on that after cloture was achieved. But non-germane amendments fall out after cloture. It wasn't that big of a deal, meaning it didn't grind the Senate to a halt. In fact, the Senate operated for more than two centuries really, really well with this practice in place. The Senate rules still allow for this. They still call for it. They still contemplate it. And our history and tradition is such that until very recently, this was the norm. But you see it. During the one time of the week, you know, prior to... Uh, a few hours ago, prior to 1 o'clock today, or at least prior to the vote that the Senate took last night, shortly before it, it adjourned for the evening, uh, before it recessed for the evening, we had a vote. And prior to that time, it wouldn't have been in order to make an amendment pending. It is now in order. It's in order now and I believe will be until we vote on cloture, likely to occur sometime tomorrow. But this is the time when we're supposed to do that. Sometimes uh, in the past, if there was um, were too many amendments, some members would get concerned about that and say, let's not call one up and make it pending. Still relatively rare, even when that happened. Look around, it's, it's not like, I mean, to my knowledge, the first senator who's offered up a single amendment to this today to try to make it pending, and yet that's too much. What, are we all too busy that we can't debate something this significant? Is our nation's border security? Are we really devolved to the point that Republican senators can't operate? in any manner without the support of Senate Republican leadership, unless they support the amendment, we don't get it considered. Even if most Senate Republicans and the overwhelming majority of Republicans at large want to see something like this debated, we can't do it. It's sad. Look, when given the chance to agree to a, a real border security provision, and my amendment, the Stopping Border Surges Amendment, would do that. This is a real border security provision, one that could actually make a difference during this administration this year and stop the invasion of our southern border. But our Democratic colleagues rise to stop it. They won't even allow us to get onto the amendment to the point that it would have to be debated and ultimately disposed of one way or another. So, Madam President, we, we now see who the United States Senate is truly, who, who in the United States Senate is truly serious about securing America's borders. If we won't even allow people to debate measures that would, unlike the provision rejected earlier this week, actually force border security in connection with and harnessing the, the willpower, the substantial willpower, especially among Senate Democrats, to fund Ukraine. We don't have that opportunity. Now, as I mentioned earlier, it's easy for me to understand why Democrats, who, for reasons I cannot understand, are hell-bent on not securing the border and on insulating President Biden and his team from the consequences of not 
taking such steps as he could and should take to secure the border. That part I can understand. At least it's consistent with the positions they've been taking. What I can't understand is why 17 Senate Republicans, having initially committed to using this as an op opportunity to force legislation that would actually secure the border, why would those people, those Senate Republicans, those 17 Senate Republicans, support cloture on this bill when I can't even offer up so much as a suggestion that we should vote on a border security amendment? So to any Senate Republicans who are part of that group of 17, who saw what just happened, I, I, I'd urge them, I'd implore them, Take that into account. Don't support cloture tomorrow, not when they've shut us out like this. You don't want to be part of that. You don't want to be part of the problem that is off the charts in terms of its ramifications for human rights, humanitarian concerns, rule of law, all kinds of things that are supposed to be important to our people and that Republicans all claim to support. Don't Let's at least, if you want to support the bill, I may disagree with you on that, but, the, but at least don't vote tomorrow to bring debate to a close. And the absence of real debate being able to happen on real changes that could actually do what we as Republicans claim to want. Otherwise, we'll see that the United States Senate will be perceived correctly as not terribly serious about forcing the border security issue now. All right. Perhaps if a, if a secure border isn't enough to make them happy, it isn't to their taste. My colleagues, who insist that they really are trying to solve this problem, should approve of my next amendment. Currently under federal law, it's illegal to vote in a federal election if you're not an American citizen. But as you scour the US code, there's, there's no real mechanism to enforce that law. This amendment would make very clear that proof of American citizenship is required when registering a person to vote in a federal election. The amendment would make it very clear that there are criminal penalties for knowingly registering an illegal alien to vote. Criminal penalties as well there should be. Because if you register people to vote who are not citizens, you're, in, you're putting non-Americans in charge of our own government. You're changing who gets to decide the direction of our government. Rather than being a government of, by, and for the American people, it becomes something else. So this amendment would make it very clear that an illegal alien who knowingly registers to vote will be subject to criminal penalties. And so will a person knowingly registering someone to vote who's not a citizen. For the next presidential election, the one coming up this year, and for every election beyond that, well, we have to take into account that we now have you know, at least 8 million, quite probably 10 million, quite possibly more than 10 million illegal aliens who have come into this country in the last three years alone, on top of those who have been here all before then, who will now be prime targets for voter manipulation. And given the way many states operate their voter registration rules, may well be enrolled in some cases automatically as they register for a driver's license or something like that. So we should be concerned about this, significantly concerned. And I, I don't know that many Americans, I, you know, I've heard even a lot of Democrats saying that only citizens are and should be able to vote. So I, it should be a very bipartisan issue. I don't know who would want non-citizens to be able to vote, and especially in light of the 10 million or so that have come in illegally recently, we can't discount the very real 
probability that a significant portion of these people might end up voting unless we put in place mechanisms for enforcing existing federal law. It makes it unlawful for non-citizens to vote. For the next presidential election and beyond, we'll have these 8 to 10 million, maybe more, illegal aliens in the country. Whether or not they vote may be dependent entirely on what we do here and whether we take this action. This, may, this ship may not pass again between now and the November 2024 election. We've got to protect our republic and the integrity of each and every American. American vote against a wave of possible illegal aliens and other non-citizens trying to vote. And so, Madam President, I ask unanimous consent to set aside all pending amendments and motions and make my amendment lead number 1530 pending to the text of Murray number 1388. Is there objection? Madam President. The junior senator from Illinois. Madam President, I object. Objection is heard. It's too bad. Madam President, as we just saw, my, my Democratic colleagues just blocked an amendment. Not just blocked the amendment from becoming law, not just blocked the amendment from becoming a part of the bill that we're debating, but blocked it even from being made pending so that it could be thoroughly debated and disposed of by a vote, a point of order, or, or otherwise. An amendment that would prevent illegal aliens, people who are not American citizens one way or another, from voting in our elections. What possible reason, what possible justification could there be for opposing the integrity of our ballot box in that specific way? Again, back to the phone book. If phone books still exist, pull people randomly from the phone book or some other source, ask people. I think you'd struggle to find many who would say, yeah, it's just fine for illegal aliens to vote in a federal election. Because, in fact, it's, it's not legal. It's just that we don't have the tools in place that we need to make that law effective to ensure compliance, to enforce the law. So I still wonder what possible reason there could be, what possible valid reason there could be to oppose that. I suppose we really do need As some would say it, we need more immigrants to come into this country to do jobs that Americans don't want to do. I've always found that argument offensive on multiple levels. I don't, I don't even really even know what that means exactly. But certainly, whatever job people who say this sort of thing have in mind, that a non-citizen would do, that an illegal alien would do, that a U.S. citizen or someone otherwise lawful inside the United States wouldn't do. Among the many jobs they've got in mind for them, voting isn't one of them. Voting in federal elections and determining the course of our government shouldn't be one of them. Is there a perception, perhaps, that if we don't put any teeth behind this law prohibiting non-citizens from voting in a federal election, that they'll be more likely to vote for Democrats? The fact that we even have to ask this question is itself troubling. And the fact that we're not even allowing this to be made pending is incredibly troubling. Now, Madam President, I've introduced amendments that would actually ensure border security and protect America's federal elections from foreign interference, things that my colleagues, I think, all of my colleagues at least profess to care about. But they'll, now they've objected even to making these amendments pending. I'm glad that the American people now have the opportunity to 
to witness this disaster on full display, to witness the dysfunction in, in a body that until recently prided itself as the world's greatest deliberative body into something that's decidedly non-deliberative. You see, that practice that I referred to a few minutes ago that was fully in place, not just for years, not just for decades, but for centuries before I got here, once you got onto a bill, and the bill was on the floor, members could routinely come to the floor, call up their amendment, and make it pending, and the Senate would dispose of it. Yes, it takes time, but it's what we're supposed to do to make sure that it's thorough. In recent years, sadly, with the assistance of leadership of both political parties, increasingly, they won't let you do that unless you have what's called a unanimous consent agreement to bundle up a whole bunch of amendments those that everyone decides, particularly Republican and Democratic Senate leadership decide, are acceptable to them to be voted on. And this often entails surrendering, limiting the amount of time that can be used to debate those things. You have to get somebody else's permission before doing that. And then get Senate Republican and Senate Democratic leadership to bless that and come to the floor and propose it in a unanimous consent agreement. It was much simpler when we would just come down and ask for consent to do, to make an amendment pending one at a time. Simple principles of collegiality and demand that we do that. Now again, I, I understand that it, sometimes uh, there might be circumstances when someone concludes that there isn't enough time. By the way, when those circumstances arise, I believe that it's more important, not less important, to let every senator uh, call up debate and ultimately vote on uh, amendments they deem necessary. Let the basic principle of exhaustion and the, the informal, unwritten social rules that govern interpersonal human interactions in the Senate be the limiting force on this. Ultimately, that is what governs it. Ultimately, these things tend not to be uh, abused. Even when in circumstances where any senator can introduce as many amendments as they want during a period of time known as budget voterama, when we're passing a budget or a bu budget reconciliation act, there is a period of time in which any senator may offer any amendment and have that voted on. Um, and even then, those tend not to last more than 24 hours. Usually we don't even make it that long because the principle of exhaustion kicks in and the social pressures uh, uh, associated with a body where everybody knows each other also kick in. Here we have none of the excuses that one might otherwise offer, disingenuously, I believe, but offer nonetheless that we can't do this. Again, to my knowledge, um, I'm the only senator who's offered to make a single amendment pending this entire day. The chamber is almost empty. Most of my colleagues are not here. If they're in Washington at all, they're not in this chamber. We ought to be able to continue debating. There's no time crunch I'm interfering with. This is a chance for us to debate and discuss, introduce, call up, make pending amendments, and ultimately vote on them. And this is a fleeting opportunity because unless those 17 Republicans decide to change their vote between now and tomorrow when we vote on cloture on the bill, and we won't have the opportunity to do this anymore. This is our only chance. This is our only shot. Look, I, uh, make no mistake, I understand that there are a lot of Americans that like this, who like this bill, who want it to pass as is. I get it. And they have every right to feel that way. I disagree with them, but I will nonetheless uh, uh, defend their, their right to take that position. But there are also a whole lot who are not satisfied with this bill. 
and who are downright offended, disgusted, hurt, or scared that we'd consider voting on something like this without even, without even considering a single change to it. So what, you, you put a few negotiators in a room, very small handful, and you say, you iron it out, you, you write it, keep it secret from everybody else until days before the Senate will even debate it, and then you limit, as they may do if they decide to support cloture tomorrow, limit to only about what, maybe, effectively speaking, maybe 24 hours, the period of time in which amendments could be called up and made pending, debated, voted on, considered. If they support cloture tomorrow, they're saying, forget that. You don't matter. Your views don't matter. Those who embrace your views and are trying to champion them in connection with this bill don't matter. Because they can't, they don't count. If you're not a super senator, if you're not part of the, the law firm of Schumer and McConnell, or not closely tied to them or in alignment with their views on this legislation, then no matter how many hundreds of millions of Americans disagree strongly, your views don't count. They can't even be voted on here. That's really tragic. It's something that we're losing as an institution. It's something we're losing as a country. So I, I put forward these amendments to protect our elections and protect our borders. These are things that uh, most senators do claim to care about, but they've objected to these amendments. And I'm glad the American people now finally have the opportunity to witness that strange resistance to even having to debate a slightly different approach on full display. I'm now going to address some other issues with the other major problem in this bill. That is the, the reckless, wasteful, bloody expense to the American taxpayer to fund a proxy war on the other side of the world. On this front, Madam President, the, the Biden administration's posture of as long as it takes and as much as it takes in Ukraine, it's not a real strategy. It's not a strategy at all. In fact, it's a, it's a blueprint for yet another forever war. Now, we've blindly sent over $113 billion for Ukraine with no plan, no mission, no clear objectives on how U.S. engagement directly benefits our own national interests, how it makes individual men and women and children in America any safer. And this blind spending needs to stop, and it must stop today. We really shouldn't be sending one more dollar, one more dime, one more penny without a plan. The Biden administration needs to put pen to paper to deliver a strategy that aligns our national interests with specific time-bound objectives. And I've got an amendment my Define the Mission Act amendment that would allow only 2 percent of funds intended for Ukraine to be released until the President delivers a strategy with specific objectives and precise timelines to Congress so that Congress can make an informed decision about these weighty, weighty matters and uh, very impactful measures within the bill. And so I ask unanimous consent to set aside all pending amendments and motions and make my amendment, Lee number 1449, pending to the text of Murray number 1388. Is there objection? Madam President. The junior senator from Illinois. Madam President, I object. Objection is heard. Well, that's too bad. <clears throat> this time, with this amendment, we see an objection. And with this amendment, we're talking about something that's a core part of what the bill actually does. 
in no way is it extraneous. And in my view, we shouldn't consider the border security and election integrity amendments either. I don't think they're ancillary to this. I don't think we should take another step in this direction without things like that. But this one relates directly to the subject matter at hand. So it would be hard for them to say, well, you're going too far afield from where this bill treads. This is a complement to existing legislation, and it's a, a basic common sense reform to what we've got now. How weird is that? that apparently the solid goals and the timelines and the expectations that we're requesting in this are just too much to ask uh, of those who spend hundreds of billions of American taxpayer dollars on proxy wars overseas. Those same masters of the universe, self-appointed here in the United States Senate, who are so hell-bent on doing this, notwithstanding understandable fear, reluctance, trepidation on the part of the American people, when asked to even defend themselves against why we're not demanding a plan, say, no, we're not even going to consider that. We won't even let you make it pending. We understand that, that, that you, Mike, are, are, are not even, you're not even asking us to pass this. You're not even asking us to adopt it into the bill. You're just asking for the chance to have it pending on the Senate floor during the one time, the one period of time in which we could consider such things on matters impacting American national security and how much every dollar spends? And the answer is no. I suppose the plans must be in their heads. It must be in the heads of the wise sages over the Pentagon and the White House and the wise sages among Senate Democrats and the wise sages among the Senate, 17 Senate Republicans who are willing to vote Yes, I'm a cloture on the motion to proceed this bill, but I, I hope, I expect, I ask, I beg, I plead that the 17 Senate Republicans, each of them, who voted for front-end cloture on this bill, will reconsider their back-end cloture on this bill. It could come as early as tomorrow because debate has been shut down. Bad things happen, Madam President, when we take debatable matters, especially important, essential debatable matters and render them beyond debate because a select powerful few refuse even to debate them. It's appalling. It's un-American. It's undemocratic. And the American people deserve better, and we all know that to be true. I suppose American families are just supposed to trust the military geniuses behind this aid package. Just like America trusted its leaders when we went to Vietnam. Just like America trusted its leaders when we went to start a war over weapons of mass destruction when those weapons weren't there. Just like America trusted Barack Obama to, to arm only moderate rebels, only people who would never turn against us in Syria. This is the kind of trust that Joe Biden and the U.S. Senate asks for now. Why would the American people and those they elect to represent them at this body fall for this yet again? Like Charlie Brown taking the football that magically disappears upon Lucy's action over and over and over again. You know what they say about insanity. I think it's safe to say that what we're doing is insane by that or any reasonable definition. But don't worry, America. I'm sure this time it will be different. I'm sure this time nothing will go wrong. Never mind the fact that we're picking a fight through a proxy war with a nation that has enough nuclear weapons to kill us many, many times over. Never mind the fact that we're $34 trillion in debt. Never mind the fact that we're being invaded across our southern border. This time it's going to be okay. Don't worry about it. Never mind the fact that we've got the world's reserve currency and that every man, woman, and child in America alive today 
has benefited materially from that status and that we're jeopardizing that very status and that when we jeopardize it more and more and more, eventually that falls and we fall with it and that fall will be unlike anything anyone has ever experienced in this country. Yet we continue to trust. Our founding document, a document to which we've all sworn an oath, the United States Constitution, <clears throat> certainly contemplates a society in which we trust each other. We trust but verify. And especially where our government, particularly our national government, our federal government is concerned, this government based here in this city, for which we are the sovereign lawmaking authority, we're instructed not to just engage in blind trust and putting faith in that government as if it were some sort of deity. As Americans, we trust, but we also verify. This should be the verification platform. If not us, who? And if not right now, in the next 24 hours, before this thing proceeds after what the bill's proponents hope to be a successful back-end cloture vote, beyond which no real significant debate, no real significant amendments will likely be possible. And who will do it? When will it happen? It doesn't materialize automatically. We have to do it right now. And what excuse do they have for not doing it? This chamber is empty. Nobody else is lining up. Nobody else is trying to make their amendments pending. And yet the Senate can't be bothered. The Senate Democratic leadership with the active, open support, the complicity of the Senate Republican leadership can't be bothered to stand up for this, to say this makes no sense. We need to consider amendments to make this better, if nothing else, to show the American people that we give a darn, that we care enough about them. And yet it doesn't happen. I'm told that I can't even make these pending. Shame on us. We must define our mission. We must, and yet apparently we won't. We won't even debate about requiring us to define our mission. Next, I want to, I want to note that every dollar of economic aid in this bill for Ukraine is a slap in the face of every hardworking American battling the cost of living crisis created by Bidenomics right here at home. Economic aid is, is not going to just magically win the war for Ukraine. Much as I think all of us would like to see Ukraine just win. We can't wish it into existence. We can't just dump enough money into it to make it happen. On the contrary, economic aid, by some measures, is proving to be a colossal waste of money. And according to some critics, may be prolonging the war by forestalling a negotiated peace. Americans will be furious to learn that billions of dollars out of their paychecks are subsidizing clothing stores and concert tickets for Ukrainians while families here in the United States are living paycheck to paycheck. No, their clothing stores aren't getting funded by this government. No, their concert tickets aren't getting funded, nor should they be. That's not the role of the government. The role of this government is to protect life, liberty, and property for this people. It's not to fund concert tickets a continent away in somebody else's war just because they're at war. It's not to pay somebody else's civil servants their salaries for an entire year just because they're at war. Some of my colleagues called the billions of dollars in economic assistance to prov provided to Ukraine is a small amount. A small amount, really? Economic assistance makes up 34% of the roughly $113 billion in assistance that the U.S. has already, prior to this bill, provided directly to Ukraine. Calling that a small portion, that's an insult to every American struggling to put food on the table and gas in the car and a roof over their heads. The leaders of both parties, at least the leaders of both parties in the Senate, will tell you that this bill cut economic aid to Ukraine and that we should be grateful for that. Oh, thanks. The only problem is it's a lie. It's a complete lie. Let's be clear. 
providing, quote unquote, only $7.8 billion in economic assistance instead of what President Biden had previously uh, proposed in his boondoggle request of $11 billion is not a meaningful cut. In fact, it's not a cut at all. That's not cutting. It's adding to what we've already given, just adding to it a little bit less than he had originally supposed. That's not a cut. Don't insult our intelligence, especially the intelligence of the American people, by calling that a cut when, in fact, it is not, and you know it is not. The bill prohibits, mercifully, it prohibits pension payments. That was part of the original plan, you see. President Biden, in his eminent wisdom, wanted also to support pension assistance. And I think that's why it's been, it's been reduced from the original request of somewhere in the neighborhood of $11 billion down to $7.8 billion, billion where this part of the bill now spends. Because they cut out support for Ukrainian pensions. That's great, merciful, I guess, that you're not requiring Americans to do that. Still doesn't change the fact that you're saddling Americans with an obligation that is not theirs, is not ours, it's somebody else's. <coughs> Money that's going to continue to pay the salaries of Zelensky and his bureaucrats whom every reputable news source in America acknowledged for their notorious corruption, even before this war started, long before the United States of America started pouring money into this corruption-saddled country to the tune of 12 figures. 12 figures, that's where you get into the hundreds of billions of dollars. With a country that already has a, an endemic, systemic problem with money laundering, with corruption, what do you think happens when you dump $113 billion into that country? What do you think happens when you then dump another 55, 60 plus billion dollars on top of that? I can give you a hint. It hasn't gotten better. And as many experts in the region will tell you, there have been Example after example where we can't account for billions of dollars at a time. Big mystery there. Big shock there. And yet, the American people are asked to continue to pay the salaries of Zelensky and his bureaucrats, everyone who works for the government of Ukraine. What could go wrong? My colleagues have also said cutting economic aid to Ukraine, again, cutting in air quotes, again. It sends the message to our European NATO allies to, quote unquote, step up and do more. This reminds me of a story I heard in college. I don't know whether it's true, maybe it was apocryphal, of a rich kid who got into trouble while in college. And his parents, did what many rich parents do in that circumstance. They took away his Porsche. And in the place of the Porsche, they gave him a brand new Jeep Cherokee. Look, this, that was not punishment as I perceived it at the time, whether that story was real or imagined. This is certainly not telling Ukraine to get its game and gear. We're not even taking away the Porsche. They've already got the $113 billion that we've already given them. We're letting them keep the Porsche and we're giving them the, grand, the brand new, top of the line, fully loaded Jeep Cherokee. That's not a cut. It certainly doesn't send the message, you better get your game and gear. Not at all. Make no mistake, this really is a laughable attempt at burden sharing. The woke bureaucrats in NATO and the European Union are completely content allowing the U.S. to pick up the tab for Europe's security. 
The bulk of assistance sent by European allies is humanitarian and economic, despite possessing the capacity and the incentive, and I believe the need, the moral imperative to send weapons. The only way to get Europe to do more is for the U.S. to actually do less. This means no economic aid and no military aid, especially after all we've done and how little they've done over there. That's the only way to get them to tighten their belts. That's the only way to get our European allies in the game. That's why I'm introducing an amendment prohibiting any funding for economic support of Ukraine from paying the pensions or the salaries of Ukrainian government bureaucrats, as well as paying for any Ukrainian welfare programs. Again, this legislation originally was expected to also pay the pensions. President Biden wanted it to do that. It's an act of mercy, I suppose, although penuriously doled out mercy, I would add, that at least they prohibited this from going to pensions. But this would add to the pensions, in addition to saying this may not go to pay the pensions, this would also say can't use it for their welfare programs or for their salaries. And so, Madam President, I ask unanimous consent to set aside all pending amendments and motions and make my amendment, Lee number 1445, pending to the text of Murray number 1338. Is there objection? Madam President. The senior senator from Nevada. Madam President, reserving my right uh, to object, uh, MAGA Republicans had their chance to work in a bipartisan fashion, and right-wing extremists in the GOP said no. I object. Ah. Objection is heard. Here we see it. So I'm a MAGA extremist, an extremist for saying that maybe, just maybe, we shouldn't be paying the salaries of Ukrainian bureaucrats to the tune of $8 billion for an entire year. Maybe, just maybe, we shouldn't Give that an, an assistance program that will also enable them to continue whatever welfare programs they've got, whatever economic assistance programs they've got in place to buy concert tickets, to keep clothing stores running as they see fit. If that's what passes for extremism in America, then I think you've just labeled all Americans extremists, or at least the overwhelming majority of us. Keep in mind... Once again, I, I'm not even asking that this be adopted. That's not what she objected to. Not asking that it be passed into law, not asking that it be adopted even into the bill. I'm just asking that it be made pending so that we can debate it, we can discuss it, and we can vote on it. You know what we heard? You know what we heard the other day from uh, these Republicans in the Senate who voted? On cloture on the motion to proceed to the bill so that we could get onto the bill. What we heard from them is, hey, don't worry, we're going to have an amendment process. You'll be able to offer up amendments, have them voted on, have them debated. You'll be able to do that. Well, that's not really materializing, isn't it? Is it? It's, it's not. It's not materializing. Just asked to make this pending. It didn't happen. And for that, I'm called an extremist. Good heavens, what have we come to? We see that some members of the United States Senate object to even modest measures protecting Americans and protecting their money from being wasted, stolen, or misused for non-defense-related purposes, for purposes that are very, very difficult to connect to any benefit on the part of the American people. If that makes me an extremist, what have we come to? It doesn't. My colleagues know that. My colleagues know that most Americans would be concerned to know that we can't even make an amendment like this pending. It's a pretty modest reform. It's not too much to ask. Oh, we are a fine, fine steward of America's finances. No wonder our country's $34 trillion in debt, much of it to foreign adversaries like China. What a disgrace. Now, proponents of, of never-ending U.S. support for Ukraine, including many of my colleagues, including, unfortunately, apparently 17 of my Republican colleagues, want America to pick up the tab for the rebuilding of Ukraine post-war. 
We know this bill perpetuates something we've seen before, which is a really dangerous and vicious cycle of obligation for the U.S. on rebuilding Ukraine and, and leaves U.S. taxpayers on the hook for massive corruption. How do we know this? Well, because the same model was used to keep the U.S. entangled longer than we should have been in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. How did that turn out? How did regime change turn out for us? For example, in Afghanistan. Not failed. Subtle democratic change. And stable democratic government. Favorable to U.S. interests. Toppled. Didn't happen. By the way, in those circumstances, I, I suppose one could have even made a slightly better argument for nation building. Still didn't support that then, and we shouldn't have been doing it, but you can at least understand the argument better for that kind of nation building and reconstruction post war in a nation where we had actually been waging war ourselves as Americans. Here, we're not even the people at war. We're just the people perpetuating that war, funding that war. Funding it to the tune of 12 figures. Money we won't ever get back, and money that, if we keep feeding it, is probably going to obligate us to even more. Waste, fraud, and abuse of taxpayer dollars. It was rampant in those countries. It'll be even more rampant here. And so I'm introducing an amendment that would prohibit any funds under this act from being used for reconstruction activities in Ukraine. Democracy is a result of dependency on the United States. It doesn't typically work out so well. I'm not sure it ever does. So let's not, exor let's not ignore this history lesson yet again. And so, Madam President, uh, I ask unanimous consent to set aside pending amendments and motions and, <clears throat> and make my amendment. <clears throat> Lee number 1443, pending to the text of Murray, number 1388. Is there objection? Madam President. The senior senator from Nevada. Reserving my right to object. Uh, Republicans had their chance to work in a bipartisan fashion, and right-wing extremists in the GOP said no. I object. Objection is heard. Okay, there's some serious problems with that. Again, we hear the words like MAGA and like extremist coming up. I resent both characterizations. I even more resent the notion that because she disagrees with the views of some members of this body, that it's appropriate, it's acceptable, that it somehow passes for a legitimate argument to brand us using slurs that some of my colleagues have chon chosen to throw out. But let's not ignore something else here. This has absolutely nothing to do with the border security provisions. The border security provisions, opposition to which my colleague has just said, somehow disqualify me from raising a suggestion that maybe, just maybe, we shouldn't be involved in reconstruction of Ukraine. It has nothing to do with the border security provisions. Moreover, unravel that argument for a minute. Think about what they're saying. Even if it were being raised, which it is not, as to my prior amendments, I tried to bring up a few minutes ago, dealing with some border security issues, even if they had been. On what planet is a member of the United States Senate disqualified from debate simply because a bill negotiated in secret by people not of their own choosing on terms that they never approved of? producing a bill ultimately that was not to their satisfaction. On what planet does that vitiate the procedural rights of United States senators to offer improvements to a bill? It doesn't. It never has. I hope and I pray it never will. And it's insulting to the American people to suggest that a condition precedent for being invited into the exclusive club of those allowed to offer improvements to an amendment are those who kiss the ring of the Senate Democratic and Senate Republican leadership in this body, the law firm of Schumer McConnell and its acolytes and associates. This is wrong. I've seen it accelerate during the entirety of the 13 years I've been here. 
I can deal with it when I think about it only in terms of what it does to me personally. It is what it is. I get really angry when I think about what it does to the American people, to those people I represent, the three and a half million people I represent in Utah, and the hundreds of millions of others represented by colleagues who are not one of the precious few. We could most of the time be counted on one hand who were privileged to see those documents to which she referred. Documents that were negotiated against the wishes of the majority of Senate Republicans, directly contrary to what we had committed to each other and to our voters to support. And now some, somehow, when we get to the floor of the U.S. Senate, because I've expressed concern on that, I'm apparently disqualified, along with any other Senate Republican who had concerns with that border security language. I'm therefore disqualified somehow from offering improvements, amendments to improve this bill, to make it less bad, simply because I objected to it, because it was not at all what any of us agreed to. That's stunning. Here we sit in an empty chamber, no other amendments offered today. No other amendments made pending today. We can't do these ones. Why? Well, those who supported this bill of both parties apparently believe that we're disqualified from having a voice here if we won't unflinchingly bow to them and what they've negotiated as if it were canonical scripture, as if it were carved onto stone. Shameful. Apparently those objecting to this and not only believe that Americans should have to pay for proxy wars on other continents on behalf of other countries against yet other countries, but also that we should more or less irrevocably, open-endedly commit to rebuilding them. Can somebody tell me when Ukraine was admitted as the 51st state? I must have missed that day. Madam President, even if my colleagues disagree with me and disagree with dozens of other senators who harbor these concerns and hundreds of millions of Americans who feel the same way but are being asked to fund all of these things against their will and their wishes, even if they believe that Somehow, uh, we in the Senate have perfect wisdom and knowledge and virtue to send billions of dollars overseas to do nothing more than stop and harm and kill evil people doing evil things so that those evil things are no longer going to be done, even if you could assume all of that, which you can't. We know that you can't and you shouldn't. Surely they would agree with me that we should not send aid to the terrorist perpetrators of the October 7th massacre in Israel. Surely they would agree with me that we should not send aid to the terrorist perpetrators who, having carried out those heinous atrocities, still have ambitions that would make those heinous atrocities of October 7th look like a Sunday picnic. I think many Americans would be shocked to learn that Congress has almost no visibility into how our funds are used within the United Nations and within other multilateral globalist organizations funded by the United States. With Ukraine alone, our own government admits, admits the following, quote, that routing U.S. assistance funds to Ukraine through multilateral institutions where U.S. donations will merge with funding streams from other international donors, has the potential to reduce transparency and oversight. Well, that's the understatement of the year. To reduce transparency and oversight. You think? You think that when we give money to the UN and the UN gives it to another UN entity and somebody gives money to somebody else, it changes hands multiple times, it's then commingled with funds from other countries, you think that's going to reduce 
transparency and oversight? Yeah, we think so, we know so. We have every reason to believe that, and we're fools if we don't admit it. But the American people aren't fools. They have every reason to be concerned about this. But why would we expect, when we know what we know, when we know what our own government has admitted very recently is the case, why on earth would we expect that, that routing our assistance for Gaza through the United Nations will be any different? Referring back to that definition of insanity, here we go again. Look, decades of U.S. bank rolling the U.N. system as its largest donor nation, both on the mandatory and on the voluntary portion of the funds that we pay. These have made taxpayers unknowingly, unwillingly, but nonetheless very complicit in terrorism and anti-Semitism and the indoctrination of generations of children living in Gaza who have been taught to hate and harm and kill Jewish people just because they are Jewish and they happen to live in Israel. The American people don't want any part of that. They certainly don't want to add to it, knowing what we know now, what we've learned about the catastrophic consequences of ignoring what happens when we ignore the problem. That's why I'm introducing an amendment to clarify that not only will our dollars stop the funding of UNRWA, this is the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, an agency that has itself been responsible for fomenting a lot of this hatred and this indoctrination, the anti-Semitic indoctrination, and otherwise proven to be of material assistance. One could say an accomplice to the crimes involving but and culminating and not limited to the attacks of October 7th. But mercifully, I suppose, the authors of this bill decided to write out UNRWA, the UN Relief and Works Agency, saying no soup for them, no benefits to them, they can't have it. But my amendment would add to that, acknowledging that the agencies supported by the United Nations are all part of a network There are close to two dozen of them operating in Gaza. And if you exclude only UNRWA from that network, that money will just go somewhere else, inflicting many of the same harms that have come through UNRWA. And so my amendment would clarify that not only will our dollars stop funding UNRWA, but they'll no longer fund any UN organization operating in Gaza. Look, we've been down this road before, funneling our aid dollars through multilateral institutions, and we know exactly how it ends in tragedy, in savage brutality in which we've been complicit through our financial support. Without my amendment, there's nothing to prevent the administration from taking funds that could have, would have otherwise gone to UNRWA and redirecting them to the nearly two dozen other UN entities that operate in Gaza, where we lose all visibility and all control over where our dollars end up and how they're used and what they fund. Enough is enough. Like most multilateral institutions, the UN is a bloated, corrupt, and really woke system, one that's far past its prime and that's proven adversar adversarial to the United States and overtly hostile to our ally, Israel. It's a platform for tyrants to mock us, for brutal dictatorships to sit on human rights committees, and for terrorists to receive aid. We can't trust this administration not to fund UN programs in Gaza, and we can't trust the UN not to fund terrorists and foment their acts of brutality which is exactly why my amendment is so urgently needed. 
And so, so Madam President, I ask unanimous consent to set aside all pending amendments and motions and make my amendment lead number 1596, or, or rather, my amendment lead number 1448, pending to the text of Murray number 1388. Is there objection? Madam President. The senior senator from Nevada. Reserving my right to object, Republicans had their chance to work in a bipartisan fashion, so, and right-wing extremists in the GOP said, no, I object. Objection is heard. Madam President, what else is there to say? We shouldn't be doing these things. We sh certainly shouldn't be doing them with reckless disregard for the very serious problems that we are creating, for the very serious existing problems that we'll be exacerbating through this legislation. We certainly shouldn't be doing this in a way that excludes a very significant percentage of the composition of the United States Senate from having any input. Did you hear what she said? Yet again, on a measure that has absolutely nothing, nothing at all to do with the border security measures that were rejected with good reason by nearly all Senate Republicans. She's on that basis calling us extremists and on that basis excluding us from even making our amendments pending. This is insane. This has nothing to do with border security provisions. This has to do with this bill. For that matter, this is a germane amendment to this legislation to exclude us simply because we wouldn't bow and kiss the ring of the law firm of Schumer and McConnell and its acolytes and associates is a disgrace to this institution. It's essentially saying you must agree with the machine. You must agree with the firm or you'll be shut out. You won't have anything to say in it. This is unacceptable. It'll be even more unacceptable, Madam President is if those same Senate Republicans who oh, just a couple of days ago and just a few feet from here on the same floor of the same building in, here in the Capitol, same Senate Republicans told us, don't worry, you'll st still have the opportunity to offer up amendments to make them pending, to have them disposed of by the Senate after we get onto the bill. And that's why they, those 17, voted that way. We'll see within the next 24 hours whether they meant what they said. Because if they did, they should be voting against this. Look at what's happened today. The only amendments that have been called up and made pending have drawn objections. Every single time. And oddly enough, as they've become more relevant, more obviously germane to the bill, they've drawn more vicious objections, dismissing those of us who have concerns with this bill and with the border security provisions negotiated without our knowledge or consent over a period of three or four months was rejected by many of us with good reason because it didn't do what we promised each other we would try to accomplish. We're told we're shut out of the process now. That's most Senate Republicans are now shut out of the process. So I ask, I, I implore, I plead with my Senate Republican colleagues, at least, I, 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 it's sad that the Democrats have gotten to this point. Senate Democrats, when I first started here, didn't do that. We didn't do that to each other generally. They're fully bought in on this now, apparently. But I at least plead with my Republican colleagues. If you voted for cloture on the motion to proceed, front end cloture, I implore you tomorrow, please don't support cloture. They've shut this down. They've shut down the very process that you told us we would have access to, the very process that the American people have come to expect and demand, especially when we're going to spend some $95 billion 
on legislation, sending, I don't know, 55, 60 billion dollars more to Ukraine after we set 113 billion dollars to Ukraine already? No, the American people demand more. They should demand more of all of us, but certainly the Republican voters should demand more of Republican senators, especially given that Republican senators as a whole, as a conference, we, we made a decision to try to use this as an opportunity to force the border security measure. And now we're told, no soup for you. So there's, you know, without that amendment that was just rejected, even for being made pending, there is, to be clear, nothing to prevent the administration from taking these funds, taking these funds that would have otherwise gone to UNRWA and just following them through some other UN entity or some other body other than UNRWA. My colleagues have rejected every safeguard, every limit, every improvement, every condition I've offered so that we may be good and faithful stewards of America's resources and the taxes taken from hardworking families, taxes that at the very least they should expect not to be used to kill Israelis, to threaten Americans, to undermine American national security, to say nothing of the missed opportunity here to secure a genuine, genuinely bipartisan agreement on something where there's not agreement in both parties as overwhelming as some would wish, but where there could be if you matched up adequate border security provision with provisions giving aid to Ukraine. We'll find out tomorrow whether those Senate Republicans who voted to get onto the bill, notwithstanding the absence of the conditions that we demanded months ago, we'll see how they feel then. I, I really hope they'll reconsider. They have every reason to reconsider their vote and to do it differently in light of the fact that they're just shutting us out of amendments. Shutting us out with the excuse that anyone who disagrees with them, anyone who takes a different position than the firm and its acolytes and associates can't even have a voice on a measure like this. Madam President, today we've <clears throat> explored the utter arrogance of politicians who believe that they and they alone can determine the risks and the rewards of proxy wars across the globe. They believe that they're playing a grand game of geopolitical chess. But as millions of Americans have seen, they're just playing with fire. We can't throw more of America's treasure into, a, into these bloody conflicts across the globe without maintaining visibility, transparency, access, and control over that, that funding. We can't do that and pretend that we're not harming hardworking families who find it hard to put food on the table and a roof over their heads because of Bidenomics, because of reckless spending like this. We cannot simply blindly dance with nuclear powers without forethought, without even so much as a plan. And Madam President, remember that before even getting onto this bill, the majority leader assured us that the amendment process would be, as I believe in his words, fair and open. But then, then, once Republicans decided to get on the bill, enough Republicans to get them past that critical threshold of 60 votes to bring debate to a close on getting on the bill, give the votes to consider it. Then, and only then, did the majority leader change his language, and he said that it would be a fair and reasonable process. Not a fair and open, but a fair and reasonable. Reasonable, apparently, in the eyes of the beholder, the eyes of the beholder being one who views anyone who disagrees with him as an extremist whose views are not worth considering. It's not extremist for the American people to ask that non-citizens be prohibited from voting in their elections. It's not unreasonable for the American people to ask that the government, for which they work months out of every year just to pay their federal taxes, only to be told that's not nearly enough because we're $34 trillion in debt, so we're going to print more money 
to make every dollar spend less far, spend uh, and go less far and buy less things. It's not fair to those same people to say that those same people are extremists insofar as they have concerns, concerns that tell them that they should want a secure border and they should want their elected lawmakers in Washington, D.C. to be demanding a degree of border security be forced on the Biden administration because it apparently has to be forced on them because they're quite unwilling to do it on their own. It is not unreasonable for them to ask those things. It's not unreasonable for the American people to ask to not have to fund acts of terrorism through agencies that have indoctrinated so many people and the hateful, hateful marinade of anti-Semitism. It's not unreasonable for them to demand that these things at least be considered or that we at least have a plan relative to Ukraine. That's not unreasonable either. These goalposts are already shifting. So who decides what's a, what's a reasonable amendment process? The three or four members of the Senate who wrote this bill in secret? The leadership? The law firm of Schumer and McConnell and its acolytes and associates? The leadership and bill managers who gave us just days to read the bill before forcing us to vote on it? Requiring us to scramble as my, my staff uh, and the staff of many of my Republican friends and colleagues have done in a short period of time to put together amendments. It's difficult to draft amendments to a bill before you see the bill. We weren't allowed to see the bill until Sunday night at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So my hat goes off to my staff and the staff of many others who have burned the midnight oil, sometimes quite literally, throughout this whole week in order to get us ready to at least offer amendments. And now we're told, no such luck, no soup for you. You didn't kiss the ring of the firm. Sorry, you lose. But it's not we who's losing I'm concerned about. It's not we in the sense of a few senators. It's those we represent. It's the hundreds of millions of Americans who are told that their voice doesn't matter because they're concerned about such frivolous things as actually securing the border or actually making sure that we have a plan before funding yet another proxy war, this time involving an adversary with enough nuclear arms to kill the American people many times over. What about the other 96 members of this body? What about the states they represent? Are they given a voice in this process? Even those who voted for cloture to get on the bill, cloture on the motion to proceed, front-end cloture as we sometimes describe it. Most of them were excluded, and if they were being honest, they were being, they were administered truth serum, they'd have to admit that they had little to no say in what went into this. This was written very, by a very small handful of people under cover of darkness over many months, and now, after being told there would be a fair and open process that magically transformed into a fair and reasonable process, which apparently means nothing. Apparently it means if you disagree with the firm and its acolytes and associates, you lose. You are excluded, and so do your voters. On Thursday, um, I compared notes and gathered information from a dozen or so of my colleagues. This isn't even all of my Republican colleagues, but just a dozen or so of us who had been talking about what amendments we thought were appropriate to be introduced. And just a dozen or so of us submitted over 100 amendments um, to our leadership team for consideration. Now, in good faith, Madam President, we've as a group, we've whittled that down. We've whittled down that list of over 100 amendments down to 28 priorities. We've worked in good faith to reduce what we're asking for. So far, I'm still the only person today who's offered up and tried to make pending even a single amendment. And even that is apparently not in order. Over time, Madam President, it's just become the new normal. The American people <clears throat> have been asked to settle so many times, to settle for a process that disenfranchises them, 
by excluding those they elect to be part of the lawmaking process. Unless they're part of this elite cabal called the firm, and those who manifest unwavering allegiance to it in moments like this, they're excluded. This is why we're $34 trillion in debt, by the way. This is why we're now swimming in a sea not only of that $34 trillion in debt, which soon is going to be producing enough in interest payments alone to swallow up other priorities, including priorities that only we can take care of, like national defense. But it's also subjecting the American people to a Byzantine labyrinth of federal regulations, laws made by men and women not of their own choosing, federal bureaucrats whose name will never be known, much less appear on the ballot to anyone in America, write laws that collectively add to the expense of government to the tune of two or three trillion dollars every single year with no ability to elect them. Now, on top of all that, they're told that even those they do elect aren't able to help them unless they're part of this cabal of a very tiny handful of people who draft the bill. This is wrong. We all know it's wrong. We've got the procedural tools available at our disposal to allow us to get around it. We cannot say, not credibly, not honestly, that we just inherited this, yeah, shucks, there's nothing we can do about it. We know that's absurd. We know that's not true. We know that's not true because the rules themselves give us protection against that. And so I say, I implore, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, but especially if you're a Republican, and especially if you're a Republican, any of the Republicans who I think all of us said we should use this as an opportunity to force border security, to harness what support there is behind providing additional assistance to Ukraine to force security of the border with an administration bent on the opposite of that. When we got a draft of a bill that just didn't do that, despite whatever nice things you want, might want to say about the language or its drafters or those, the intentions of those who were trying to produce something, it didn't do that. It didn't do that to the point where all but four Republicans voted against it. So the fact that we're now being told the default to that is that Democrats win, Democrats get the support of 17 Republicans who will support not only the legislation crafted in secret that unites Democrats and sharply divides Republicans, but also alienates overwhelmingly, and with good reason, most Republican voters. They are going to be accomplices now in shutting out debate. I ask, I beg, I plead all my colleagues, especially those Republicans who purported to share that concern. But whether they express that concern or not, regardless of how they feel about border security and, for that matter, what, regardless of what political party they belong to, they should care about making sure that our money is not going to fund interests hostile to the American people hostile to their interests to make life more burdensome than then. We have a certain implicit obligation that we take on when we take our oath of office, an obligation to ensure that we first do no harm. This bill violates that. And deep down, deep down, a lot of my colleagues realize that. Remember, it only takes 41 votes, 41 votes Opposing cloture stops the bill, stops it either indefinitely or until such time as these concerns could be resolved. They're not insuperable concerns. They're not unreasonable concerns. They're certainly not concerns that should be shut out from debate. So I ask, I plead, any of my colleagues who happen to, for whatever reason, be listening to my words at this moment, and for any voters out there who, for whatever reason, happen to be listening to me on a nice Saturday afternoon. If you share these views, share them with your senators. Encourage your senators to allow the American people into the dark 
and secret tent in which things, things are being negotiated to the exclusion of every American. We're a nation of laws. I hope we always will be. Despite our flaws, our country is the last great hope in a world that's increasingly hostile. And I hope we'll always be available to be that. We can't do it when we treat our own people this way. We can't do it when we ignore risks like those that we're ignoring today, as long as we continue this. So I implore my colleagues, and I implore voters out there who have the ear of any of my colleagues, to oppose cloture tomorrow. We haven't had a fair and reasonable process. We haven't had a fair and open process or any kind of process on amendments because the firm is determined to exclude us. Determined to exclude us in a way that benefits the military industrial complex and will earn pats on the head for a small handful of politicians in America, but otherwise undermines American interests, especially when we refuse even to consider opportunities to make the bill better or at least less bad. That's not too much to ask. Thank you, Madam President. I yield the floor.